name is Jan Pomowski, and on behalf of the Guild, I'm pleased to welcome you to our joint conference with the African Research Universities Alliance on strengthening the African Knowledge Society towards more sustainable African-European university partnerships. When Commission President Ursula von der Leyen came into office in December 2019 in the European Commission, she prioritized a new strategic relationship with Africa as a top foreign policy ambition. Since science ministers, uh, science ministers from the African Union and the European Union responded very quickly. And at their first ever summit in July 2020, they agreed on four joint priorities for cooperation in research and innovation. Public health, the green transition, transition innovation and technology, and capacities for science. The Guild and Arua had already developed by that point a number of positions which, where we demanded that we need to invest in the long-term capacity of African public universities. Given that between 60 and 90% of African research capacity was in public universities, we argued that if we want to strengthen innovation and uh, research to achieve the AU's ambition of, uh, for an African knowledge society by 2063, then this can only be done by strengthening African public universities. For this, we need long-term capacity building to complement project funding, and we need to develop new equitable partnerships through clusters of excellence, fostering new kinds of inter-African and inter-European collaboration on an equitable and sustainable basis. A few months back, this position was endorsed by 20 rectors conferences right across Europe, and these represent over 1,200 universities. Earlier this year, the EU sponsored the ARISE pilot program to strengthen excellent frontier science in Africa. And we see this as an extremely important first step in strengthening the AU-EU strategic partnership through research and innovation. But there is much more potential. Just a few, back, uh, just a few weeks back on the 28th of October, the second joint ministers of foreign affairs uh, between the AU and EU affirmed that two of the four key goals for the forthcoming AU-EU summit in February should be a joint response to the pandemic, a focus on the recovery through the green and digital transitions and uh, a couple of other priorities. As the AU and the EU prepare for a joint innovation agenda to be introduced at the summit, foreign ministers explicitly acknowledged the key role of education and skills development, as well as research, technology and innovation in the green and digital transitions. So there is a huge momentum now developing to ensuring that universities and the research, edu education and innovation that they foster are integral to a joint AU-EU vision for the future. And this is coming both from the sector, but it is also coming from the policymakers. So this raises a number of key questions. How can universities respond to this challenge, ensuring that they can contribute fully to the African Knowledge Society? What does the need for more equitable partnerships mean for universities and scientists in Europe and Africa? After all, currently, the inequality between both continents is visible not least in science and technology, with, with only 6% of Africa's population currently fully vaccinated against COVID. And how do we bring together the need for short-term recovery, which is very real, with the need to build up long-term capacities in universities in research, education and innovation, uh, so that they can strengthen African societies in sustainable ways. In this conference, we'll be pleased to address these and other crucial questions as we discuss how we can better empower universities to strengthen the African Knowledge Society as a central element of the AU-EU strategic partnership. And with that, I'm very um, pleased to hand over some uh, words uh, to Ernest Ariety, who will uh, speak some words of welcome on behalf of the African Research University Alliance. Thank you very much, John. Thank you very, very much. The, let me begin by uh, thanking all of our uh, participants for joining us this morning. The, uh, it's important for us that uh, you show interest in what we are doing, and we are very, very pleased that you are doing just that. Uh, this conference is about uh, strengthening the African Knowledge Society. Uh, and this is what Arua. Uh, stands for. This is what Arua has been set up to do by African Vice Chancellors. And we are very pleased that uh, this is going ahead in a partnership with the Guild. Um, the relationship that we have built with the Guild 
is a good illustration of what we mean by equitable partnerships. Together with the Guild, we've been working in the past uh, couple of years to strengthen our institutions. The several universities that are members of Arua and also those that are part of the Guild working together to develop equitable partnerships. We do this showing by example how we pursue that. For us, the purpose of today's conference is extremely important simply because we intend to work with the African Union and African governments to develop that knowledge society. The understanding between the EU and the AU and pushing ahead with innovation, pushing ahead with research, pushing ahead with education. These are all vital elements of Africa's future growth and development. We at Arua are very, very committed to working in partnership with African Union to find solutions to this. We are very interested in working with the African Union to develop the institutions that will lead to the new knowledge society in Africa. So we are very pleased that uh, the African Union is working with us in this conference. We look forward to a future in which we can work even more closely together, solving Africa's many, many development challenges. So we thank you for coming and we look forward to engaging you throughout the conference and beyond. Thank you. Back to Jan. Thank you, Ernest. And uh, just before we proceed, just a, a couple of housekeeping rules. So we will be tweeting during, during the event and we invite everybody uh, to join in the conversation under the hashtag, uh, hashtag Arua the Guild, and you can see it here throughout the conference. Um, the event is recorded and will be available online soon after the conference. And um, please ask your questions through the Q&A, not the chat, but through the Q&A. That allows you to also vote for the most important question to you. Um, and we will, as uh, we have planned in each uh, session time to, to respond to questions. So we, we hope to get through as many questions uh, as possible. And of course, we also invite you to read our position papers um, as we go um, after the conference, um, because we will refer, be referring to them uh, from time to time. But, for, but right now, it gives me a great pleasure, uh, and it is, it is an honor for us, uh, to introduce um, Her Excellency Sarah Anyang Agbo, Commissioner for Human Resources, Science and Technology at the African Union. Your Excellency, um, thank you for joining us to this conference, which considers how we can strengthen um, science and innovation through collaborative clusters of excellence at Africa's public, public universities. Commissioner, um, the word is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we okay. hear you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I appreciate you inviting me to participate in this conference. Excellencies, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, I stand on existing protocol. It is my honor and pleasure to bring you warm greetings from the chairperson of the African Union Commission, His Excellency, Dr. Musa Faki Mahamad. I also send appreciation to the African Research Universities Alliance, Arua, and the Guild of European Research Intensive Universities for organizing this conference. Indeed, the theme of strengthening the African Knowledge Society towards more sustainable African European University partnerships is very apt at this point in time. The main question we need to ask is, to what extent are African societies benefiting or using knowledge for their socioeconomic and technological advancement, particularly because of the, of the African Union slogan, African solutions to African challenges. It is important to note It is important to note that even as African universities have grown in number with a massification of both the number of programs and students, the role of universities in national development is quite limited. Typically, research outputs from most universities are not cascaded to policy for applications at the various domains, such as environmental protection, agricultural productivity, and infrastructure. It is very important that we find a synergy between policymakers, 
the academia, and of course, the private sector or the industries, so that the research will leave the shelf to the marketplace, to the end users who need it. And the people who, at the end of the day, turn this research work into marketable products are the industries from the private sector. In order to address the gap, there is need for African universities to reimagine their raison d'etre and have a paradigm shift from the current situation, which is largely laissez-faire. This complacency needs to be looked at and we need to work on it. The political will should be able to drive this change. It is very, very important. And to reimagine education, higher education in the African society, we need to work together as a team, even taking best practices from international um, um, universities. One of the key approaches to strengthening the knowledge society is for our universities to become innovative and entrepreneur in nature and outlook. This approach will entail universities having clear interdisciplinary research agendas aligned with the developmental challenges of the continent as clearly outlined in Agenda 2063 aspirations of inter alia having a prosperous continent. How do we develop an integrated, prosperous and peaceful Africa driven by its own competence and skilled citizens able to play in the global arena without working towards a good education that speaks to the mismatch of skills that can actually help sustainable development in Africa. Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, as a community of scholars, it is important that we position ourselves at the forefront in providing solutions for addressing adverse and potentially long-term challenges hampering our universities and educational systems. Urgent interventions are needed in all education ecosystems that will, among others, eliminate inequality, reduce poverty, prevent needless deaths and illness, enhance employability, broaden participation in democratic processes, foster peace, and ultimately build back and develop our economies. To do this here of, uh, accentuates the importance of the theme of this Arua the Guild Conference, strengthening the African Knowledge Society towards more sustainable African-European university partnerships. Africa's premier development blueprint, Agenda 2063, commits to speeding up actions that will, and I quote, catalyze education and skills revolution and actively promote science, technology, research and innovation to build knowledge, human capital, capabilities and skills to drive innovations for Africa's future. The envisage education and skills revolution will only be possible if those charged with making the revolution to happen take action. We need to implement action. We need to go beyond rhetorics. We need to walk the talk. And to do this is to look at all the areas as dictated in the continental education strategy for Africa to make Africa's education quality in line with the SDG4 goals. It is therefore enlightening that this conference has provided a platform for engagement of distinguished thought leaders from the public, private, academia, and social sectors seeking solutions to achieve the desired education and skills development outcomes in Africa. Of course, the importance of education to the Africa we want cannot be overemphasized, even as Nelson Mandela once said that education is the greatest weapon that can transform the world. It is true education that the daughter of a poor man or a son of a poor man can become a president, a vice president, or a CEO in the world that we are in. African knowledge societies need digital innovation to thrive especially in Africa, it is incumbent upon us to ensure that the requisite innovation ecosystem is in place. This includes, among others, the enabling policies, requisite skills, enabling policies that member states can take and walk the talk in their different nations, 
so as to make sure that action is implemented on the ground. Sustainable financing architecture for research and development, and of course, an active participation of the private sector. This is very important. This is a synergy that will give us a win-win effect and impact in the Africa we want. Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, in order to strengthen our efforts in reaching the sustainable development goals and the aspirations and vision of Agenda 2063, the African Union has developed several strategies and framework such as the science, technology, and innovation strategy for Africa, CISA 2024, the Continental Education Strategy for Africa, CISA 2016-2025, and the Digital Transformation Strategy for Africa, the DTS. These are all strategies accepted by the assembly and it is expected these strategies start working in the various member states. When fully implemented, these strategies will strengthen global partnerships for education and skills development in the continent as called for by the Continental Education Strategy for Africa. The African Union has set up a coalition of partners in thematic clusters for implementation of this Continental Education Street for Africa that is based on the 12 objectives of the Continental Education Strategy for Africa. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I therefore urge Africa Research Universities to re-examine their curricula and modes of delivery and align them to societal needs. We must be able to reimagine education, education that will give job to the bulk of our over 70% youthful board that we have in Africa. Education that can make them to be self-confident, have self-value, have self-esteem in order to operate in this world and stop the different asylum seeking in European Western countries, etc and stop the various deaths in the Sahara and even in the Mediterranean Sea where many have died with un unnamed and on un 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 unnamed graves. There is also need to strategically leverage the technological advances in industrial and digital transformation to deliver carefully targeted trainings and educational programs to the huge number of students who are in their need of employability skills as well as entrepreneurship. We must make sure that we look at our universities. As we say, in the vision of the African Union, competent and skilled citizens able to play in the global arena. How will they be able to play in the global arena if the courses we give to them are mediocre and have not changed? How are we able to instill in them the right confidence to stay back home and see Africa and dream the African dream if the right infrastructures are not put in place? How are we able to do this? to teach our children to have the right kind of education. If the teachers themselves are not motivated, they are not reskilled, they are not rebranded in order to teach upskill and, re and, and, and new courses that can actually change the world uh, of the students. So in conclusion, I must salute the efforts of the African Union and the European Union partnerships that are geared to support the skills for employability and entrepreneurship. These are noble undertakings if properly harnessed, will lead to the transformation of the continent. Sincere gratitude to Arua for uh, being able to, uh, to organize this conference in order for us to have a dialogue, and I hope this dialogue will not end as a cemetery. From this dialogue, we may be able to take action on the ground that will speak success, progress for the Africa we want. I sincerely thank you for this opportunity to speak and I wish you the very best in your deliberations. Thank you. Commissioner, Your Excellency, thank you so much for these uh, really um, ex uh, extraordinarily wide ranging and important words. They will really um, frame this, this, this conference, I think. Um, you talked about how uh, we really need to reimagine African higher education. Um, and you really emphasize the potential of this interdisciplinary research agendas to really inform society and, and to inform uh, the transformation of knowledge uh, leading through to innovation. And the other thing you, that I found really particularly striking is that you really focused on the role of universities in really fostering 
skills of, of new generations, of new generations of students, but also entrepreneurships and of society. So you, you really focus on the role of universities at, 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 at the core of an innovation ecosystem. And you really raise the bar, very much focusing on this point that we really need action and we really need to walk the walk. And I think that these are all extremely important um, notions for us to really think through during the rest of the conference. So Your Excellency, thank you so much for your very important words. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm very pleased now to, uh, I think with the, this is already an excellent introduction for our keynote uh, presentations. And um, I'm very pleased to, to start with uh, Peter Maaßen and Nico Klute. Uh, Peter um, is uh, um, uh, Professor in Higher Education Studies at the University of Oslo, an extraordinary professor at uh, Stellenbosch University, while Nico is research professor at Stellenbosch University and guest uh, professor at uh, the University of Oslo. Uh, Peter Nico, um, let's just go straight. Uh, let's just start straight with uh, um, uh, Commissioner Akbar's um, uh, words and and really think through um, the 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 role of universities as as the core as a core part of this ecosystem that she referred to, but of course at, at the core of this is is the research really and so maybe um, it'd be great to re hear a little bit more from your own work from your research uh, about why universities are such central actors when we discuss the strengthening of research innovation in Africa. Over to you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, your excellencies, distinguished um, uh, participants in this important conference. As Jan Polnowski um, mentioned in his um, introduction to, to this keynote, uh, Professor Klute, University of Stellenbosch, and, and I will address this issue of the performance and potentials of Africa's research capacity, focusing especially on universities. In our presentation, we will uh, address uh, some of the um, positive developments, the very important positive developments that African universities are going through at the moment. But we will also uh, address and reflect upon key challenges uh, that are uh, facing the universities in Africa for realizing their science potential and contributing uh, in the way that the commissioner and also uh, Professor Palmowski in his introduction and Professor Arietti in, the, in his introduction have, have indicated. So, so how can um, uh, we get a better understanding of where universities in Africa are at the moment, where they come from, and what the challenges are that they face in realizing their potential? Uh, Professor Klute will start uh, the presentation and um, after his uh, introduction and um, in, uh, presentation of the data, I will um, come back to you. Uh, Nico, the floor is yours. Good morning, everybody. I, uh, thought that uh, just as a brief background, uh, why are these two guys uh, talking about this? Uh, is to say that Peter and I started uh, working together in 1995 on the Mandela, Mandela set up commission on transforming South African higher education. But by the middle of the 2000s, we got a bit bored with transformation and we got interested in development. Aid. And then uh, in development aid, we discovered there were different models operating, particularly the World Bank model. And then uh, there were also, of course, other countries. And that it had gone through stages of the colonial development and the development of individual uh, colonial development in institutions. Then came the issue of that universities were not important. I think it's very important to remember that that there was at least a 10, 15 year period in the world where there was a general attitude towards Africa and the rest of the developing world that higher education was a luxury, that it was nice to have, but not really important. That started changing in the late 1990s with evidence and theories from Castells and these people. So that in 2000, the World Bank itself came up with constructing knowledge societies, which is a uh, Course, and today we're talking about strengthening the African knowledge society. And what is very important in this is, is, is the shift towards the issue that of the research universities, the particular role of the universities, of the research universities, which Peter and I worked on from about 2010. 
and then which con directly contributed to Arua and then the interaction with, with Arua and, uh, and the guild, of course. And underpinning that is a, is a shift in the model so that uh, we can say today, I think, that we've, moved, that we've moved from development aid into trying to move into a model of partnerships and collaboration. And then the key question is, of course, how does that work? But uh, before we get there, Peter and I have both been asked the question quite often, but are there, is there excellence in Africa? And with, with who can we work? Who can we collaborate with? Uh, and that, of course, partially led us to look more closely at the research output and the activities within Africa. Peter, can we go to the next slide? What's very important about this uh, from the world of science, uh, the web of science, and we've got data up to 2020, uh, is the in increasing output of Africa. But what's very important is that this increase in contribution comes against a huge increase in research output from Asia and from China. So it's not that the rest of the world is standing still and Africa is now getting a bigger, uh, bigger share. Africa is actually getting a bigger share while the rest of the world is also producing more. So that is for us a very positive uh, development. Next one. And in terms of uh, citations, uh, there's also a consistent, not quite as dramatic, but quite a consistent increase, which uh, has been maintained uh, right up to 2020. Next one. This is a relative strength of fields. We were a bit, actually, we shouldn't have been surprised about religion uh, coming from Africa. But it did lead us to write an article in University World News uh, asking, uh, does Africa need more pastors or more engineers? Uh, but uh, I think that is something to look at. Uh, but there is also strength in agriculture, which is very important. Engineering could be strengthened. But perhaps we will also see when we come to the centers of excellence uh, that that picture is shifts. Next one, Peter. This was part of our Irana project of. Uh, uh, over 10 years, we, we looked at eight African universities. Uh, and, the, and the aim of that was to actually strengthen research universities, to identify them and to let them collaborate. Uh, it was funded by Carnegie and Ford Foundation, but uh, that project stopped in 2018. But it shows three clusters of institutions. At the top end, of course, the South African one for now. Uh, from Cape Town to Pretoria, and then a middle group, and then a group. But what it shows is that in all of them, there's an increase in output, more in some than in others. Uh, but so it does show a very differentiated uh, picture. But nevertheless, uh, the, the whole trend is upwards. Next one, Peter. This is quite a worrying uh, slide uh, sh showing that uh, a decrease in EU contribution. And unfortunately, we only have the data up to 2018. But in recent developments, uh, it's quite clear that there is uh, going to be an increase in, in EU. We're not sure about the UK at all, but definitely in EU uh, contribution to uh, collaboration. Next one, Peter. This is the first part of a bigger project that we're doing on centers of excellence in Africa. In total, we've identified, I think, 85 or something like that. Uh, the, the, and we really would like to uh, get a better understanding because the word center of excellence is used very differently in Africa. The World Bank's notion of center of excellence is that you have, uh, is my, actually mainly to improve masters and PhD students. In the South African centers of excellence, it's an entirely different approach with international evaluation and all kinds of uh, indicators that has to be met, et cetera. But it does show that there is a, a definite, uh, there's an increase, uh, a substantial increase over the last decade. And it's now going to be interesting to see uh, what the actual research and PhD output strength of these centers of excellence are, which is our next project. Peter? 
This just shows the alignment with EU priorities, uh, which has been set up uh, in recent discussions uh, that we got from EU, which shows a, a certain, uh, uh, definitely uh, that the majority are in the green, blue, marine economy and energy transitions, which is, uh, which is very uh, heartening you know, and we're very pleased about that. And, uh, and as we know, there is a very strong public health, uh, which we think will probably after the pandemic uh, get even more stronger. Over to you, Peter. You muted. Thank you, Nico. And I want to uh, again emphasize the importance of these data and the positive picture that they that they show the development of, of science and the, the growing potential of science to make the kind of contributions to development in Africa that also the commissioner was referring to. And the data produced in Stellenbosch by the uh, Center of Excellence in Scientometrics and Science Technology and Innovation Policy and CREST, the data are uh, of importance also because they uh, show that some of the myths about uh, uh, science in Africa, like the, the continuous um, statement that uh, African uh, science doesn't contribute more than one to one and a half percent of global science output, these myths uh, simply are outdated. But in realizing the great potential and the further development of science in Africa and, and the central position of universities in it, there are a number of challenges that we feel should also be addressed uh, today. And the first of these challenges has to do with the level of uh, science spending, uh, the, the um, uh, investments in R&D in, in countries in Africa, as well as the number of researchers. And these, pick, these data from UNESCO show uh, with the um, African countries for which there are data available in the UNESCO database, the R&D database, they show them in red on the left side of the, the picture, while the, the European, the EU countries in general uh, have a, a much higher um, investment, the level of uh, percentage of GDP invested in R&D than African countries. So here is a major challenge. If we want to move towards the partnership that everyone in Africa and, and uh, Europe is uh, convinced is the, is the future, if we want to move to the equal partnership, then this is a, a key issue. The issue of uh, the high level of uh, investment uh, in, in, uh, in R&D in uh, most of Europe, the large number of uh, researchers uh, per million of population, and the low level of investments in Africa, and the, um, the um, significantly lower number of researchers per million of population. And here we already have good examples of what the African-European collaboration uh, can lead to, how it can contribute to creating a more uh, equal uh, playing field uh, in, for example, the ERISE program uh, of the European Union and the African Union, the ERISE program, which is a major first step in the contribution to uh, attractive career paths for scholars, for researchers in Africa. The second point is the poor collaboration between scholars in Africa. While the African science output is increasing in absolute and relative terms, the intra-African research coll collaboration is, is um, uh, lagging behind. We see that uh, a large part of the increase of uh, scientific productivity in Africa is a consequence of uh, intensifying relationship with scholars elsewhere. In Northern uh, America, um, in the, uh, Europe, the EU especially, uh, but also China, Australia, Japan. So in order to um, stimulate the intra-African uh, collaboration, which is um, uh, of course hugely important for addressing uh, Africa challenges and issues, uh, the idea the, uh, that we've come up with as um, investments of clusters uh, in clusters of excellence can be a key component in uh, strengthening intra-African uh, uh, research collaboration. The third point is that um, the interface between science policy and the institutions um, is um, so, uh, at the moment not um, in uh, place yet in Africa. It's emerging. There are a number of uh, continental institutions that are being involved in bridging the gap between science and policy, 
but as also the commissioner was referring to this gap is still existing and what can be done about it. It's definitely an issue that, that also in the African European collaboration should be addressed. And one of the institutions that we will hear more about in, in just a few minutes, the African Academy of Sciences is an uh, institution which plays uh, a key role in the uh, implementation of the uh, ARISE program, the ARISE program that um, has started um, um, or has published its first call this year. And we will see the results of uh, the work of the uh, African Academy of Sciences and the partners in Europe in um, the early next year. But this is an example of an institution that could become a key institution in the interface between science policy and uh, the scientific world, the academic world, the universities. But if we compare the African and European situation with, for example, the, the Guild having its uh, secretariat in, in Brussels, close to the European Union, uh, the uh, uh, European uh, Association of Universities, many other um, uh, European networks and alliances being represented in Brussels, uh, interacting with the Commission. How does that work in Africa? How can we contribute to strengthening uh, not just the, uh, the interface between science policy and the scientific community, but by creating strong continental institutions that can play a vital role in uh, the further development of the science potential of Africa's universities and other research institutions. And finally, um, the data that I showed you um, uh, from, from UNESCO also show that there is a, a problem, a problem in the sense that many uh, key data are not available uh, and, um, and there is no such thing as a valid continental database. In order to be able to make decisions on further investments in science and in the interface between science and policy, as well as the interface between science and society, and to stimulate also the innovative and entrepreneurial capacity of universities, what is extremely important is the development of an African science database, a database where key uh, statistics and indicators uh, show uh, how science is developing in Africa, where there is a great potential uh, where investment should make sense, etc. As long as such a database is not available, it will be very difficult to make uh, valid and, um, and uh, effective decisions on the further development of science in Africa. The data that we produce in Stellenbosch are data that are uh, produced through projects uh, at the center of excellence. They're important, but um, what is needed is that countries in Africa agree upon the key indicators with respect to science and also make sure that they report on it uh, and, and uh, contribute in that sense to a continental uh, database. How can, uh, at the end of our uh, introduction of our keynote, how can um, the, the equal partnership, the strategic equal partnership that the African Union and the European Union are um, uh, agreeing upon is the future move away from development aid uh, collaboration uh, to equal partnership. How can that be realized? The first is, of course, as uh, Nico indicated, investments in uh, the science capacity, the research capacity, the innovative capacity of universities and other research institutions in Africa. The second is addressing these um, challenges in a meaningful and effective way. Only an integrated approach, both investing in research capacity and in research productivity, as well as uh, um, uh, integrate and uh, uh, relating and addressing these challenges in an integrated way will um, contribute to uh, the realization of the potential of the African science community. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Peter and Nico. Um, and uh, this has been, uh, it's been really uh, important, I think, to hear not just about the, the, the success, the real success of African universities uh, that you could demonstrate with your figures at, at increasing their share of, of world leading science, albeit from a low base. Um, but it's also really important, I think, then to, um, uh, hear, to think more or to begin our thinking really about how we can develop an integrated approach 
uh, towards uh, strengthening the capacity of science of African universities so that they can do what um, Commissioner Agbo has demanded, that we can really walk the walk uh, together through, through these universities. Um, I'm very pleased to, um, to introduce our next uh, uh, keynote speaker, uh, that, uh, Jane Catherine Nagila, who is the Executive Director of the African Academy of Sciences. And this is, of course, the body, Peter, that you mentioned um, that uh, is, is one of these bodies that, 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 bridge, that helps bridging the gap between science uh, and policy. So I'm particularly delighted uh, to, uh, to, to welcome her. She holds a leading position in fostering research excellence on the African continent through uh, the African Academy of Sciences, of course. Uh, Catherine, thank you so much for joining us. The floor is yours. No, thank you very much um, for that kind introduction. Um, I would want to share the slides uh, myself so that I can, you know, uh, fasten. Um, as introduced, um, of course, my name is Catherine, Professor Angila, the Acting Executive Director. And of course, I'm very happy to be invited. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone, uh, depending on from where you are. And of course, we are talking today about the strengthening uh, of capacity for universities towards sustainable Africa. And of course, through the partnership with the European partners. Um, this is my contact uh, in case you want to contact me, uh, my research uh, links. I would like to talk about the African Academy of Sciences and at the same time also talk about the strategy and business plan for cooperation, research co cooperation by the Academy. And thank you very much. Um, uh, Peter for uh, you know, bringing in that issue that the African Academy of Sciences is the link uh, between the academia as well as the, the industry and also the funders. Uh, also looking at the today's uh, presentation, basically the theme is strengthening African knowledge society. And I'll look at uh, a few of these uh, areas, for example, the EU Africa cooperation, the Arua guide, of course, we are um, already familiar with that situational analysis with regards to the research in Africa, policy formulation, and the role of course, the African Academy of Sciences in research agenda, research management, how do we make sure that um, uh, there is good grant finance uh, management. This is uh, something that the African Academy of Sciences is really involved in and many others. So uh, about the African Academy of Sciences, I think you're very much familiar, most of you that is, um, the vision is to transform lives through science. And of course, the mission is to leverage resources through research excellence and also through thought leadership for sustainable development. And the AS, of course, is a partner of the African uh, Union uh, through the joint partnership of African Union Development Agency and new partnership for Africa development, and plus many other several um, governments that we partner with. It's a non-aligned, non-political, not-for-profit, Pan-African organization. Head office is in Nairobi with uh, five regions, uh, offices in the five regions of Africa. Uh, we've seen is a tripartite mandate, recognition of excellence in the continent, advisory and think tank functions, implementation of key STI programs, and uh, all many others. Now, the areas of the African Academy of Sciences, the fields that we engage in terms of thematic areas is climate change, health, well-being, research, uh, education, gentle, um, societal sciences, and of course, uh, social sciences, humanities, uh, water and sanitation. And then we've got subject areas where we have got committees that uh, um, they provide think tank functions and the different uh, thematic areas in the academy. The academy also has a platform, which we call AESA, that is Acc Acceleration of Excellence, Alliance for Accelerating Excellence in Science. And we've got four goals, that is uh, building, R&D leadership in the environments, particularly in the universities, supporting development of an innovation and science driven entrepreneurship, because we want to make sure that uh, research has got uh, as a product will go towards innovation. And so that we can be able to see the real uh, time pro um, uh, profits of that. Identification and supporting rising uh, research that is mentorship, very important for the academy and of course targeting the critical gaps uh, for example, COVID, uh, now we have learned the lesson that we must be, as Africa, we must be uh, ready for challenges that are yet to come. Uh, looking at just overview of the EU, AU cooperation, so that we can align ourselves, uh, digital economy, which has been said, digital um, uh, transformation, green economy, sustainable growth, uh, peace and uh, governance and migration and mobility. 
Now, uh, of course, the Arua, uh, well, we know the objectives uh, are very, very important. And I, I, I captured this objective so that I can be able to align with what the African Academy of Sciences is doing. The importance of research, education, and innovation to ensure higher education and research can meet Africa's economic and societal demographic, uh, demographic um, uh, challenges to ensure that higher education is a central component of EU and AU, and also explore ways in which European and African nations uh, can be able to coordinate their efforts and discuss uh, distribution and contribution of researchers and universities to achieve the objectives. Now, uh, I looked at a paper, the situation analysis, I call it, that is uh, looking at uh, statistics. The Africa spends about 0.5% of its GDP on research and development, uh, which is significantly less than the global target of 1.7. And of course, the target for African Union, which is about 1%. And so as an example, 100 researchers per um, million people, which is again far much less, almost 10 less than 10 times less than what the global average is, which is about 1,100 researchers per uh, million people. And so there is underdevelopment in Africa and Africa really has to pull its legs um, and socks so that we can be able to ensure that um, uh, we, we walk the talk. Uh, in increasing investment in R&D, uh, supporting cutting edge uh, basic research, empowering uh, African researchers so that they can position themselves and compete uh, globally according to uh, the AU agenda uh, 2063. Gender parity is very important. And so therefore that is uh, one of the components that we have to always be aware of. In terms of the policies, when you look at the 2017 African Union and uh, European Union Summit that took place, of course, they came up with a partnership for sustainable growth and uh, jobs, education, research, and innovation. Uh, in terms of coherent post-2020 strategic um, uh, framework, boosting research and innovation. And we've got a program that has been funded and rightly said by uh, Peter, that the African Academy of Sciences is implementing one of the strategic uh, uh, cooperation between AU and EU, which we call the Africa Research Initiative on Scientific Excellence. Uh, which is a pilot program, is aiming to reach about 40 countries, uh, 40 researchers in 40 different countries. And already the call went out and we are in the process of now asking, um, uh, communicating with the people who have been um, shortlisted so that they can uh, submit a full proposals. We expect this program to start uh, around April and May next year. And as many um, researchers and also drawn from different countries as possible, of course, in line with the African Union, uh, SDI, as uh, Madam Commissioner uh, talked about, uh, sister 2024. Uh, the role of the African Academy of Sciences in research, and uh, we're looking at uh, some of the issues, particularly when you look at our path to appetite market, one of them is policy and think tank functions. And we also do mobilization of funds through our platform, AESA. And we also do a lot of investment, particularly most of the grants, they also go into uh, improving the infrastructure in the in the different African uh, universities that we are funded. We are very good um, and very strong on mentorship of early career researchers. And we've got a committee for gender and education to look at uh, some of the issues. Uh, the AS is a unique role, uh, it's a, unique, a unique role in uh, as a Pan-African scientific organization promoting the national research partnerships. And also it is well positioned, particularly with our partnership uh, with the African Union and also um, many strategic partners um, uh, from both um, regional as well as international. And ISA platform uh, supports that. We've got a program at the ACE, which is a research management. And this is aimed at building capacity at universities, particularly to in, in increase collaboration between and within African universities through the funding that we normally get. A capacity building using evidence-based benchmarking, Africa leadership supported by global expertise on research management, building on existing structures, and also a long-term approach uh, to research management so that when a university gets funding and that funding comes to uh, completion after the cycle, they should be able to have a sustainability plan uh, to continue on that. The interdependent uh, factors that do uh, influence the sustainability of research and management in the different organizations, particularly institutional leadership is very important. Uh, but if, particularly if management is not uh, at par, or rather they are not buying into the researchers' um, uh, interest and also uh, planning and strategic planning, that becomes a problem. Long-term commitment, high quality standards, we have to have good practice 
And also individual capacity development is very, very important, uh, particularly training managers in different universities to, so that they can be able to manage research in this um, organization. I talked about the ARISE program, which is the African Research Initiative for Scientific Excellence, uh, which is being implemented, implemented by African Academy of Sciences and of course uh, funded by EU in partnership with the African Union. Uh, the effort is, um, it has an effort towards a more attractive and inclusive continent uh, for bright minds so that they can be able to be exploit uh, their potentials by creating open and direct competition for funding among uh, these very best African women and uh, men researchers. It's a pilot program, like I said, and will complement and reinforce support modalities and also targeting capacity building, um, specific priority research themes, Brightest mind, I talked about the talent and ideas recognized and also um, investment in R&D uh, we talked about. These networks and organizations, they promote research, education and innovation in Africa, particularly the African Academy of Sciences, the African Research um, Universities Alliance, Arua, the Pan-African University, which has got five uh, centers of excellence in the five regions in Nigeria, in Nigeria, that is uh, North Africa, West Africa, East Africa, Central Africa, and the Southern region. The Association of African Universities also contribute particularly on high education institutions. Now, of course, when it comes to the health and disease control, the African CDC is very, very important. Some of the projects that the African Academy of Sciences has been able to do to create capacity, particularly for highly career researchers, uh, human hereditary and health in Africa, which is funded by, has been funded by the National Institutes and also Welcome Trust, the Gates Foundation. Uh, then also developing excellence in leadership, training and science, which we call it Deltas Africa, which goes to produce scientists or researchers with capacity to publish and also lead locally uh, institution, again funded by DFI, DFCDO. Climate change, which is also funded um, uh, by DFID UK. Climate Research for Development is another program that was funded by UNECA. It is United Nations Economic um, uh, Commission for Africa. Other, other uh, programs arise, uh, has been funded by uh, Carnegie, uh, Carnegie uh, Corporation of New York. Um, Future Leaders, which was funded by, that is um, Future Leaders African Independent Researchers, FLAIR, was funded by Royal Society as a program that has come to an end. African Postdoctoral Training Initiative, uh, or APTI, which is uh, funded by National Institutes of Health and also Gates Foundation. Um, we also have the AS Affiliates Program that is uh, mentoring um, young researchers by pairing them with established researchers. We also have mobility schemes, such as uh, science mobility, to ensure that Anglo and Franco-African, uh, they tend to uh, collaborate and partner together. It's also mobility funds for Africa-India mobility. Again, this is a, a partnership between Wellcome Trust and the Department of Biotechnology in India. Climate change, I think I talked about this is a repeated one. Now, uh, towards the conclusion, uh, the African Academy of Sciences has a platform uh, for global grant community to ensure good financial grant management. Uh, this is to ensure that uh, there is good practice on financial management, human resource procurement and governance. So what we usually do is that institutions, particularly universities, we subscribe so that we can be able to do pre-qualification and then towards certification under the global grant community. There's also another platform, which is the open um, access platform to ensure that fellows, affiliates, and all the people who have been given grants through the African Academy of Sciences have an opportunity to publish and have um, access, uh, open access to journal publications. Uh, towards the recommendation, I'm coming to the end now. I know I've taken long. Um, some of the recommendations I have in mind is that to, for, for us to improve research infrastructure in African institutions and universities is very important if we are going to realize the goal of Africa transformation. Uh, establish collaboration between European and African institutions. Uh, facilitate uh, mobility funding to enable researchers to visit well-established researchers and also partner in terms of gaining skills, strengthen research management processes, because giving grants to institution is one thing, but the institution to manage that grant and also uh, so that they can optimize the, opti um, the output is very, very important. Good financial grant uh, practice is very important. Open access is very important because that is the only way for the most unfortunate 
uh, institutions that cannot access journals, they have got an, an opportunity to do that. And of course, mentorship, mentorship, mentorship of, of early career researchers, because we are building, we are trying to grow the timber for the future. It's very important innovation and entrepreneurship to be incorporated in the most of the research grants. So the way forward continuing, of course, enhance the capacities of, for, of emerging African researchers, strengthening institutional research management, and of course, generation of cutting edge. How do we do that? Uh, through workshops, conferences, joint project uh, implementation, meetings, workshops, skills training programs, so forth and so on. And of course, everybody must come to the table. That is, if we are going to realize research, education, and innovation partnership. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, we would like to appreciate all our funders uh, for the African Academy of Sciences towards transformation of the continent uh, communities. Thank you. Catherine, thank you very much for this very rich presentation given to us uh, in, in an ama with amazing focus. And in a sense, you, you really uh, took up the, um, the, the charge from Peter and, and Nico to, to really explore what that might mean to really have an integrated approach. And so, what, so you really talked about um, how we need to create a, a you know, strengthen you know, universities from a perspective of research management, a university leadership, um, the interdisciplinary. Whoops, I see that I'm not. Uh, you, you talked about the interdisciplinary um, potential of, of, of universities, and you showed how the African uh, Academy of Sciences is, in fact, uh, uh, de uh, developing this um, uh, the support to, uh, for all of these uh, functions. And finally, I think you also really underlined the importance of early career fellows. Uh, and early, you know, and, and really focusing on on developing the capacities of the next generation of of researchers. Um, and I'm I'm sure that's you know really from and, and that really also lies very much with the position of Aru and the Guild, which is really to to start with research masters and really go all the way to to PhD and early career professionals. And of course, the Rise program that you are that you are um, supporting in a, in a critical way um, that that is an extremely important example uh, and pioneering example of this kind of approach. Thank you, Anne. So um, we are coming now to the next of uh, to to our first uh, panel, um, which uh, which is composed of a number of very, of very distinguished uh, speakers. Before I uh, introduce them, um, I I see that already there is a lot of uh, activity on our chat to really. Um, uh, for people to really engage with, uh, as people are engaging with uh, um, very common concerns, we have a lot of uh, participants from um, very similar, like-minded organisations that that have a real uh, investment uh, in in these questions of how we can uh, strengthen um, the African Knowledge Society through uh, through uh, research and research-led innovation, education, and societal engagement. Um, and so, please uh, continue those those activities to. Meet Meet, you, meet each other, but also ask questions in the Q&A um, uh, sections of this uh, chat. We will now uh, bring them to our panelists, but also um, engage in the debate on, on Twitter with, with the hashtag that you find here on the screen. Um, so given this, uh, real pos pos given this real possibility, which we've just really heard from a whole range of perspectives um, from Peter and uh, Nico and Catherine, um, for universities to really make a step change to their contribution to societies, how can uh, universities respond to this? How uh, does how can uh, we defend, develop new forms of collaboration? And what follows um, for policymakers? Or to really again phrase the question in the words of Commissioner Agbo: How can universities walk the walk and not just talk the talk? I am uh, joined by um, a number of very distinguished uh, university presidents, um, beginning with uh, Nana Aba Apiamfo, who, is, uh, who has just been inaugurated as Vice Chancellor of the University of, of Ghana. Uh, welcome to you. Uh, I'm joined by Adam Habib, uh, who is Director of the School of Oriental and African Studies, and he was formerly Vice Chancellor of the University of Witwatersrand. Uh, Barnabas uh, Nawangwe, who is Vice-Chancellor of Makerere University, uh, welcome. 
Uh, Bernard Scholz Reiter is not only rector of the University of Bremen, but he also joins us in his capacity as vice president for international affairs of the German Rectors Conference, which was instrumental in really developing the support uh, of, of Europe's Rectors Conferences uh, for strengthening uh, the African Knowledge Society through new kinds of partnerships. And finally, Svein Stolen is a uh, rector of the University of Oslo, and he's also vice chair of the Guild. Um, the panel is moderated by our colleague, uh, Professor Funmi Olonishakin, uh, who is a vice president of King's College uh, London. Funmi, I give you the floor. Thank you so much, uh, Jan. Let me uh, first say a warm uh, uh, welcome, warm greetings uh, from London uh, to our participants. Uh, it's my a singular pleasure to host this uh, uh, eminent panel. Uh, and I think we already heard uh, in the previous conversation, the state of play with research uh, in, in Africa, uh, but with public research universities uh, producing uh, perhaps most of the research output in Africa, we have the figure being anywhere from 50 to 90%, depending on uh, the national context uh, you're looking at. Uh, we now know that African higher education institutions play a leading role in strengthening and supporting the African Knowledge Society, while, of course, educating citizens uh, and, and future leaders of the continent. And in this regard, African universities are the driving forces uh, behind the continent's evolutions and growing influence uh, on a global stage. It is important, therefore, to begin to look at the sorts of impacts but also look towards the future uh, following COVID-19. It's clear that the pandemic has slowed down the rise uh, of the African economy, like some other economies in other regions. Uh, but the question of vaccine inequalities between Africa and Europe has raised in particular questions around the capacity of the two continents uh, to collaborate and overcome self-interest. Uh, in particular, on matters that are as fundamental uh, as global health. So, so in this regard, there are several questions uh, that we can throw open here, and they are uh, eminently sensible uh, to consider. Uh, can universities help lead a post-pandemic society? Can universities help define a new African-European solidarity to overcome pandemic uh, and environmental particularism? Can they lead by example, informing new types of relationships between each other. And in this panel, therefore, we ask you to consider how universities can make uh, a sustainable contribution to the African Knowledge Society and what conclusions for policymakers. Um, we will continue with the pattern of doing this, if you like, uh, in, in conversational form. Uh, I will be asking uh, our eminent panelists uh, a number of questions one after the other. Uh, we will leave time towards the end uh, to, to consider questions from the floor uh, as well. Uh, I guess in no, not in the order in which they were introduced, I will want to start with you, uh, Professor Adam Habib. Uh, the question uh, uh, to you is, can African and European universities help lead a just and equitable post-pandemic recovery? And how can they make this happen? in practical terms. I know this is a, a, a subject that has really occupied your attention for some time, and I hope you can help us uh, elaborate on that. Uh, so thank you for me and thank you colleagues for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be here and it's a real pleasure to be able to share my thoughts. Um, my answer, I'm gonna go straight into the answer and that is that of course, uh, it seems to me that uh, European and African universities uh, can uh, work together in a more equitable uh, post-pandemic recovery. But it seems to me uh, it, they can only do that if they're willing to do that. We need political will, if you like, uh, both amongst governments, but also amongst university leaders. And they have to do it differently from how they behave pre-pandemic. Uh, why they need to do it? Well, it's not going to be charity. Uh, they have to do it because for their own futures. Uh, all of our challenges, and I think this pandemic shows it in the most graphic of terms, are transnational in character. And if we're going to survive them, we have to cohere as a, as a human community. We all either learn to swim together or we will all sink. And that's what European unions and European governments need to recognize. And that's not only the pandemic. 
it's climate change, it's inequality, it's renewable energy, it's social and political polarization. All of our challenges are transnational in character. So that's why we need to do it. But if we do it, we need to do it differently. Until now, our notion of solidarity was give a couple of scholarships to talented people in the developing world and in Africa, bring them to London, Berlin, Paris, New York, and Beijing, and uh, train them there. The problem is with that is most people don't go back. The statistics, the research is quite clear. Not because of any malevolence, but because life happens. You bring people in the very age category, in the very life cycle in which relationships build, et cetera. So if we need to do it differently, it seems to me we need institutional partnerships. We need our engagement to be grounded institutionally and we need our institutions, our, our engagements to go to scale. And to do that, we need co-teaching. We need co-credentialing. We need uh, co-curriculation. And we need to do that on the teaching front, but we also need to locate research centers that are jointly worked and jointly owned on the continent itself. And the reason you need that is because you need good science and local knowledge to come together, but you also need to be able to train on scale. And it seems to me that that's the thing that we need to do, and we need to generate public resources for it, but we also need business models that enable it. And at the moment, in large parts of the world, including North America and where I stay uh, in the UK, frankly, our business models undermine it. They don't enable it. And that's what we've got to completely reorganize and rethink. So it's possible to do, but only if we think differently, we have the will and we behave differently from how we've behaved thus far. Adam, thank you so much. Uh, thank you. You've put a, a, a number of issues on the table very quickly. Quickly, The question of brain drain, which you know can be resolved, you know, at, at least can be reduced if we did things differently. Uh, the question of equity and being able to use, uh, bring the local context into account. And of course, a new business model, which sits at the core uh, of the very conversation we're having. And yet at the same time, we're not aligning the brain drain question with the ways in which we think of migration at the moment. Mm -hmm. A lot of food uh, for thought. Thank you. I'll come back to you anyway. But let me go to um, uh, Professor Nana uh, Apianfo. I have not had any uh, a chance to congratulate you uh, on, uh, on assuming your role as uh, Vice Chancellor of the University of Ghana. Uh, many congratulations. Please, uh, over Thank to you. you. Yeah, thanks. The question I would like to ask you uh, is this. There's so many competing pressures for policymakers. What argument would you make from your own uh, perspective uh, as a vice chancellor of Ghana's leading university uh, that universities need to be central actors in Africa's recovery? It's an argument that is being made, but, you know, uh, slowly. So how do you see this from your own perspective? Yeah, thank you, Fumi. Well, I ask who are policy makers? They are essentially our governments and their agencies. And like you mentioned, indeed, they are competing considerations. But key is the political gain. And in this era of democratic elections as a means to get into power or remain in power, governments in power right after one election are thinking about the next election. And this is what ultimately drives policy. So we tend to be short-sighted, driven often by unsustained policies. Now universities like mine have both the expertise and the culture that drives studies that are fact-driven, data-driven and scientific. So essentially based on observation, logical reasoning, systematic and objective methods. And when you take the University of Ghana, for instance, they are credible and time-tested re research institutes. For instance, the Institute for Statistical, Social and Economic Research, the Institute for Environmental and Sanitation Studies, the West Africa Center for Crop Improvement, Institute of African Studies, 
the Gucci Memorial Institute for Medical Research and so on. And we have demonstrated during the period of this pandemic so you have uh, Noguchi Memorial Institute for Medical Research, the West Africa Center for Cell Biology of Infectious Pathogens, and our School of Public Health. These have been at the center, yes, of uh, providing service delivery and support, but most importantly, these and other units of the university have studied not just the biomedical aspects of the COVID-19 virus, but also its social, political, and economic impact on our society, as well as its impact on our cultural norms, linguistic practices, and so on. And this clearly places the university in a unique position to lead the nation's recovery. There is so much information that the university has and can and should be of benefit to the larger society. So if policymakers collaborate with us, We'll pick up the we will pick up the necessary information that we need to form the basis of policies that will drive the recovery process. Maybe on our part, we need to be a bit more aggressive, going beyond uh, disseminating our research through our peer-reviewed publications and be out more in the public space, so that they get to know more of what we do. And there is a lot more confidence in collaborating with us on this road towards recovery. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Nana. I, I think your concluding uh, remarks are so apt. Uh, getting out more, uh, make more of our research, be in the space, be in the policy arena more, be in that decision making arena more. And you started also with the important point of who the policymakers are. Uh, we're dealing with them at national level, at regional and continental levels. Uh, perhaps we also need to play a role more as universities to align uh, the thinking, to align uh, the, the policy priorities as much as possible when it comes to uh, this question at the core of our discussion. Thank you so very much. Um, I now go to uh, uh, Professor Svein Stolling. I, it's a pleasure to ask you this question in particular, given uh, what I know is the active role you have played uh, bringing people together in the Circle U uh, University Alliance. But this question is not about Circle U, uh, actually. Uh, it is this, why is collaboration with African universities so important for a European university like the University of Oslo? And if you could tell us, uh, you know, what from your perspective are the key challenges in enhancing collaboration. Uh, over to you, Svein. Thank you so much, Finmi, and I'm very happy to be here representing both the Guild and the University of Oslo. I think it's to some extent obvious. Africa plays an increasingly important role as a close neighbor and also an important political, economic, scientific, and cultural partner. Uh, and both the European and the African Union uh, have identified science as a key means to delivering inclusive and sustainable economic growth to address climate change or the challenges on the United Nations sustainable development agenda. So these are challenges that we have in common as many of the previous speakers has underlined, Adam and Mark. The pandemic is a, is a, is a telling example of how we need to, why we need to interact. Local challenges are often, often global. And uh, what appears to be a challenge in one country alone may fast strike every corner of the world. For that reason, I think that the University of Oslo and, and European universities in general, I believe they aim at making significant contributions to the knowledge base needed to, to address the major global challenges. Um, the present or a future pandemic being one example, of course, but climate hunger are others. And the effective solutions require a strong commitment from universities all over the world. It requires partnerships, global connectivity between universities, between academia, but also outside academia with other sectors of society, goal number 17, which again requires strong universities and institutions all over the world. And this is acknowledged, I believe, in, in our, or it is in Agenda 63, where a number of key continental milestones are set, including building an African knowledge society through larger investments in higher education, science and technology. I think that's imperative. Uh, and then not at least building stronger research institutions, stable, robust institutions. 
And I think we as a university, University of Oslo, and also European universities in general, would like to take part in quotation marks, this type of construction, if we can call it that. And then I'm happy to see that the EU and the African Union aim at more equal, more long-term strategic partnership. I think that's absolutely necessary. We need to move away from relying on short-term project-based funding. Instead, we need to move towards uh, and enhance institutional uh, capacity for excellent research and innovation uh, through long-term collaboration. Also institutional collaboration where there is also a will and a pressure from the university that helps bottom up initiatives with strong but uh, top down type of support. And I think that the proposed Gilda Rua clusters of excellence is one part of the answer which will strengthen African research and innovation and help building this type of collaboration. All the key components include world class infrastructure, which I think is absolutely necessary, digital but also uh, physical, robust doctoral, postdoctoral programs and career development and opportunities for young researchers and research groups. You need sufficient resources and infrastructure to avoid the brain drain that we have been into a little bit earlier. And I, at last, I would say that it's extremely important to take this knowledge into use, of course, in society. So the interaction with the rest of society is important. And it might also be that the initiative that we have had in Europe that we are working on, since you mentioned Circle U, the European University Initiative could be also of interest to, to link, um, how to say, alliances in Europe and in Africa and build also a common platform in that way. So I'm, um, I'm, I think that the European universities are eager to take part in this and I'm looking forward to further interaction. Right. Thank you so much. I, I think you've returned us to where we started in a sense, underscoring that point. Uh, I think it was made by uh, Adam at the start that these local problems are also global. And he mentioned this, you know, all the problems that we are all trying to solve together these days are transnational in nature. Uh, and I think you've reinforced that greatly, your, your point about taking a long term view and not just a short time, you know, short term approach to funding. I think that is very striking. Uh, the evolution of the Africa, you know, the EU Africa strategy, uh, I think it's clear to see that the conversations we're having today are not the ones we're having 10, 12 years ago when the argument was very strongly about equity. I'm not sure that we, we have achieved it, but that, you know, we're placing it center stage and we're putting the university and its potential contribution there it is, you know, it's progress in this conversation. Thank you, Swain. I, I want to proceed to uh, Professor Nawange. It's good to see you again. Um, I want to reverse the question I just put to Svein and ask you what you see as the key challenges that you face in a major public university. How, how, you know, how can collaboration with European partners help in this regard? Over to you. Uh, thank you, Funi, and it is nice to see you too. And the congratulations to my colleague Nana upon being appointed. Thank you. See. Uh, let me first begin by uh, giving the general picture of where Africa is heading. And maybe that might uh, help for people around the world to understand why they must take special interest in Africa. Uh, it is estimated, as we all know, that uh, by the year 2100, uh, every second person on earth will be living in Africa. Now that should uh, interest everybody because if it doesn't interest uh, people, then probably we don't understand the magnitude of uh, the problem that could be there if we don't do certain things right. So with this very high population growth, coupled by the other challenges that face the continent, uh, our continent is the worst affected by climate change. Uh, we are getting beginning to get diseases that we did not know about in the past. Uh, the issue of food security, if even now sometimes some people go hungry in Africa, what if the number, the, the population grows by three times as is estimated within that period? How are we going to feed them? Uh, then the conflicts, uh, we already having a resurgence of conflict, which had sort of gone down 
and probably some of the things that are happening point to uh, the causes of this uh, uh, conflict returning. So in the context of Africa, African universities must take the lead. There's no, there's no question about that. They must take the lead because uh, uh, currently practically all knowledge centers are based in universities. We have got some research institutions. They are doing a good job, but they are few and they are not covering everything. So universities are extremely important in being the knowledge bases for the proper policy for our governments. Now, the AU came up with the Agenda 63. Now, 63 is not a very long time to, to, to go. And the, uh, of course, the aim is that uh, we should have uh, got everybody in Africa living a reasonably, uh, uh, you know, acceptable life, a minimum standard of, of life. That is a very huge uh, a ambition, especially as it is coupled with what I've said, the high population growth and the issues uh, of climate change and others. So we really have a big, big responsibility as African universities to address these issues. And the, this is the reason we came up with the African, the uh, Africa Research Universities Alliance or Arua to come together and try to synergize our efforts so that uh, we can uh, learn from each other, we can do things together, we can uh, raise the impact that we have, uh, which we would not have as individual universities. And I think Arua is already in its infancy doing a good job in that direction. So we, our, our biggest uh, challenge, of course, was that, you know, despite this big population, our population is just the same as China and India now. Uh, and, the, and yet we are producing only 2% of all knowledge and our GDP is uh, probably equivalent to the amount of knowledge we are producing. Uh, so this is a huge problem. And therefore, uh, we, we, we resolved, we must do something to change uh, this situation. Uh, of course, the, the individual universities have been doing a, a great job, but together we are able to do even more. Now, the relationship with the EU, first of all, the Europeans are our closest neighbors. They are just across a small ocean, okay? And I think the effect of being close to us is felt by both continents. They were very, it was very easy for them to come down and conquer us and colonize us. But also now they are beginning to feel the impact of immigration due to strife. So we must work together. We must work together to, to resolve these issues. Uh, I think that uh, uh, the African universities, what we need to do now in order to be more effective in what we are doing is to increase our capacity for research, to increase the effectiveness and the impact of the research that we do. Uh, because if we do not do that, then uh, most, most likely the situation we are experiencing could only get worse. And how can this capacity be built? How can, uh, for example, the EU and the, our sister universities in, in Europe be engaged with us in this? Uh, I think the uh, building that capacity can include the uh, research management training and the putting more emphasis on higher education. Because I'll tell you fully that uh, our population is the same as, uh, as China, but the whole of Africa is producing 2,000 PhDs per year. China is producing now more than 50,000. So how can we ever dream of catching up with them? Uh, thank you. Thank yes. you so much. Thank you. I, I mean, you've raised some really fundamental points about you've helped us locate Africa again in this conversation we're having, uh, the rising youth bulge, which sometimes it's not uh, easy for people to understand when we talk about what uh, the UNFPA, uh, you know, and others have, or UNDESA and others have predicted as something that will rise till 2050. 
and the idea that those who would double the population of Africa today have already been born uh, doesn't always sink in. And in that respect, that Africans have to take charge and lead this pursuit of excellence and collaboration. That point is well made. Where we are in research terms is far off. And I think Peter Masson's uh, presentation also drew some more uh, diagrams for us in that respect. Uh, thank you so much, Prof Professor Nawange. Uh, last, but by no means least, uh, I want to call on uh, uh, Professor Bernd uh, Scholz Reiter. You are not only the rector of the University of Bremen, but you also represent the German Rectors Conference, which together with 20 other European Rectors Conferences called for a new approach from the EU to support collaboration with African public universities. Why did you develop this initiative and what are you trying to achieve? Thank you very much for asking about this initiative. Uh, the call was launched in June this year and was addressed directly to the EU commissioners in charge. And it was supported not only by the 20 signing national European rectors conferences, representing, by the way, more than 1,000 universities, but also by the European University Association. And I think both underlines the importance of this appeal. The necessity of significantly strengthening cooperation between Africa at the various levels is obvious and was already presented in the keynote speech. The fact that this must also include research cooperation and that this cannot be left to national initiatives and funding programs alone, but also requires a European response was the main motivation behind this initiative. So given that also other countries and regions have begun to introduce strategic initiatives for strengthening their scientific collaboration with the African continent, the European Union needs to make sure that it remains a key scientific partner for Africa. And in this context, the current negotiations between the European Union and the African Union about a new mutually beneficial strategic partnership for the period 2021 to 2027 provide an important window of opportunity for strengthening the role of research and innovation in the relationship between our two continents. And we like to achieve that the European Union makes substantial investments in the research capacities of African universities, a key component of the new strategic partnership between the African Union and the European Union. Thank you so very much, uh, Brent. I think you have reinforced um, this, this issue several times over, and I know where your heart lies in, in all of this, how to make bring the two continents together uh, to a point where we begin to you know, simultaneously address some of those transnational questions those that affect us collectively, but also those are, that are distinctive for Africa. I think that's where uh, we need to be recognizing that we, we need to pull together and do things differently. Thank you uh, for your response and thanks for your brevity. Uh, but I, I want to go and I wonder uh, whether to start with you or Adam. It's not in any particular order. I have received two questions, um, but actually we've had a number of questions. These are the ones that I picked uh, from, from the floor, and they're similar. The first is, how can one ensure the sustainability of research capacity building programs in Africa uh, towards an independence of funding coming from outside of Africa? This funding question is a vi very vital one. Who funds and how that is used and what priorities uh, are, those funds are used for have been repeated issues. Uh, there's a similar question to that. From the presentation of the director uh, from the African Academy of Sciences, it is clear that science research is, uh, is underfunded in Africa. Outside the funds that come from, from outside Africa, how do we get our government industries and philanthropists in Africa to commit to funding science research? Uh, it's why I said at some point, maybe I'll turn to uh, Adam and others, but Bernd, I have you here. 
And I wonder whether you can reflect on any one uh, of those questions, just taking okay. a short minute uh, to do so, so that we can go around and uh, get other perspectives from the panelists. Thank you. I was wondering, Bernd, do you want to give, uh, do you want to try to respond to that? Yeah, the idea could be like in other programs between different nations and continents that we set up a kind of matching fund. So if uh, one partner pays 50, 60, 70 percent, the other partner has to match the fund and that increases the investment in research of the other partner. That could be a solution. Excellent, excellent. Thank you, thank you so very much. Um, now, interestingly, this match, uh, you know, the, this idea of you know matching the funds is one that we've seen, maybe not consistently, maybe not systematically. Uh, perhaps there are ways in which we can uh, drive African uh, collaborators to do that more consistently. But I'm not trying to. Uh, pronounce anything or make any judgment here, but Adam, maybe you could reflect on that uh, for us. And so, don't offer your comments on any of the two questions too, please. All please. right, well, thank you very much for me. I'm going to make a very, very practical uh, recommendation because I do think we could do some very quick things. So the first, it seems to me that if we want to drive postgraduate programs, open access to library resources, and open access to uh, open access publications. This is something that we could do easily. Uh, we've got corporate and legal uh, impediments to this. The EU is in a position to very, very easily open up access. It has done so for many, many libraries in Europe, uh, across European universities, and extending that to the African continent would make a fundamental difference. Two, join courses co-credentialed, co-taught, co-curriculated in perhaps five of the big sustainable development goals, pandemics, climate change, inequality, uh, etc. To make some of that happen, you're going to need laboratory capacity on the continent, which means co-owned and co-curriculated, uh, co-owned uh, laboratory capacity. And by the way, we already have that. In health sciences, there are many, many European universities that have investments in Africa around Ebola, around HIV AIDS, et cetera. We need to extend this to the, to the other sciences, the social sciences, the natural sciences, the engineering sciences. Um, there's a debate that has been uh, raised around how do we get equitable resources? Well, it seems to me what that requires is some commitment by the EU that says some I don't know, 10% of the EU budget to the AU will be ring-fenced for, for, for universities and the continent and for these collaboration. In exchange, African governments need to put in so much of their GDP that is committed to universities and their sciences. The final thing that it seems to me that we can look at, and that's important, is the issue of uh, existing uh, technological digital resources. If we move towards a blended learning approach where courses, where lectures can be taught and tutorials hosted in both Europe and in African institutions, and we have those collection of resources there, this is possible to do. Finally, I would start in four or five programs at the master's level and the PhD level. Get it going on that front. And once you start, getting some movement on that front, you can begin to, to, to expand in this regard. Finally, sorry, one final thing for resources. If you want resources, one is, as I said, EU of its existing resources. Second is a commitment, a matching ground, as was suggested by Baron around African governments putting it. And third, what is impossible about attacks on multinationals in the African continent that is dedicated to building African institutions of learning. It can be small, we can start there, and it can be globally organized that is dedicated for African institutions. We've done these things before. We did them in Europe, we did them in development, uh, developing societies. It seems to me the same rules 
could apply. It's only what stops us is an ideological rigidity. And some pragmatism would take us a long way in this direction. Madam, thank you so much. I could say a lot. I'm going to shut up as, as moderator, but I think you have put quite a number of issues on the table. Uh, and it, not just food for thought, but practical ideas as you know how we can begin to transform uh, this uh, thing that we're talking about. And you have constantly connected education with research. We have tended to separate them quite a bit uh, in previous conversations. Thank you for that. I want to ask any panelist that wants to jump in and say something at this point in time so that I don't just uh, uh, pick people. Professor Nawange, I'm going to come to you next uh, and try to squeeze in one round of questions. But uh, if um, Zvine or Nana would want to say something, please do so uh, on these same questions as well. Otherwise, we, we can just move on. Yes, Zvine, I see, I see your hand. I would only like to add one perspective because it's, it's a challenge always to persuade the governments to put more money into research. And maybe one of the main issues is to show the decision makers the use, how we are able to take knowledge into use. So I think that the connection between universities and the rest of society needs to be emphasized. And, and it's a lot of, of, of uh, pressure uh, should be on the universities to be able to take the knowledge into use in order to also how to say, secure the investments for the future. So we have a responsibility here ourselves, I guess. It's fine, thank you so much. If we go back to Peter's, uh, you know, map, uh, chart of where you're seeing investment in research in Africa, of 54 countries, there are probably seven maximum. <laughs> this says a lot. So how one is going to, if we take Adam's point of how we're going to therefore uh, get governments, particularly in Africa to match, and I think bringing the EU is, you know, uh, investment to bear in a way that a certain percentage is dedicated to uh, universities or to research uh, begins to take us that place. But unless that is, you know, part of the agreement negotiated up front, that African governments will contribute this, we might not be getting there. So the idea you're, you're bringing helps us really try, you know, we can begin to reflect on that because this is, this is a moment of opportunity to do just that. Um, Nana, are you going to add one or two just, things there, or shall I move on? Yeah, yeah. Just, just a quick one to say that the, the advocacy side of us as academics should begin to become more prominent. We have to continue to do this, not just with our governments, but also with our philanthropists and with our industries. And because, I mean, if, if, if governments are usually a bit slow in this regard, but at least if they see the partnerships that we have with industries yielding fruits, seeing uh, African philanthropists funding research on the African continent, and that constant engagement, we literally have to be in their faces. That's the only way we're going to get them to fund research the more. No, no, thank you so much. I, I couldn't agree more uh, either. We need to find a way to, uh, you know, put, every conversation together and not do that in isolation. And I think you're saying bring industry to bear, bring philanthropy to bear uh, and do what uh, I think Adam and Svein, Svein are, to are talking about, which means we leverage the EU interest in Africa in a significant way. Thank you. Now I'm going to start asking us to speak. We had a really good first round of conversations. I think I let things just continue I want to get as much into this time as possible. Let's spend no more than two minutes on the next round of questions uh, for each. Apology, so that we have more time uh, to, uh, to discuss things. I want to start uh, with you, Professor Namangi. When you think about uh, the, pro the challenges of the future, and you were quite concrete too, when you talked about uh, this youth bulge, the rising youth bulge, um, every African will be, every one uh, out of two people will be an African in 2100 or thereabout, um, not, 20, not 2050. Um, let's see what this means when you look at a particular challenge of the future. Uh, so how can you, collaboration with European partners help? 
Can I be suggestive and say one other challenge you mentioned was migration, for example. If I were to suggest, you, you don't have to take my suggestion, but you can take another challenge that you see as a, the, a challenge facing our societies in the future and look at how we can strengthen this collaboration. I keep picking on migration because uh, avoiding brain drain is not the same as the ways in which we see the EU and African conversation around migration at the moment. If you look at the communique from, I think, October 26 between EU and African ministers, we're not yet on the same page. That's my argument. Professor Nawange, what do you say to that? Take any issue, please. Just one. Yes, uh, I think uh, uh, what we are all talking about, uh, our contribution should be to ensuring the stability of African countries. Uh, once these countries are going to be unstable for the reasons that I stated, then it is going to be a problem for everybody. And uh, for me, I see investments in higher education and especially research as the key. And maybe just a comment in, in relation to the earlier question about sustainability. I think the experiment that we have seen at Makerere can be a good thing uh, for other universities to, to learn from. Because uh, we, we were lucky and there was quite heavy investment by Sweden in our uh, research you know, docket. And because we have trained a big number of researchers, they now, the researchers are now bringing in more research funds than all donors put together. So just create that capacity. And it is these researchers that are going to come up with the solutions. And we have seen it during COVID-19. When the government didn't know what to do, they turned to the universities. And the, the universities are the ones that started now giving advice on what to do. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Um, I think we can have now have a flow of conversation to comment on each other's uh, points uh, as, as we take this further. What do people think about the challenges that we face, about the common uh, denominators even uh, within Africa, um, between Africa and Europe? What is it? How can we take some of the ideas that Adam's been talking about that has been uh, elaborated upon? Um, and Nana, you know, pushed us further to say that we need to expand it beyond um, government or policy makers and bring in industry and, um, uh, if you like, philanthropy. Can we, can we get more comments, uh, please? Or you can comment on any of the other panelists' presentations as well. That, that is very welcome. Uh, if I can just make a comment on uh, the issue raised by Nana on uh, the governments which uh, look at only shortly, I mean, short, uh, can I call it short-sightedness of governments? Uh, I think it is a real problem, but probably we need to do more as universities uh, because we have always been complaining that they don't come to consult us. Maybe we should do, do turn it around. We should force our we should force them to listen to us. Eh? And we can only force them by coming up with a, a policy and criticize their policies, uh, I mean, constructively, so that they don't think that universities are interfering in what they are doing. I think we need to be a little bit more proactive. And that's the only way we shall bring them to listen to us. Otherwise, this is just likely to continue. Can I uh, come in? Thank you. Yes, please. So it seems to me that there's a couple of things we could do. Firstly, is what I think Nana and, and Barnabas touch on, which is ad advocacy. Uh, we clearly need to do a fair degree of advocacy on the African side to the African Union and on the European side to the European Union, and part of this is happening. One of the things that is worth saying, Sven, is that already 75% to 80% of research on the African continent is applied which means it's related to one or other set of issues and concerns that people have. So I think that that should be part of the advocacy. The second is the programs we launch, especially in the early years, should be tied to sustainable development goals and could have very, very practical conclusions about creating capacity that's urgently needed around public pandemics, 
around climate change issues, et cetera, et cetera. One of the big challenges around climate change, and we've been talking to banks on the continent, has been that they need to think through how to invest in the transition from fossil fuels, but in a continent that isn't energy, doesn't have a surplus of energy. How you do so is going to be fundamentally different to how you do it in the middle of Berlin or in the middle of, of, of London, et cetera. So that, it seems to me, is the second thing. The third thing is advocacy on other sides, because there are major challenges to what we are talking about. Funmi will tell you that the UK has just agreed to increase its international students from 480,000 to 600,000. That's going to undermine everything we're talking about here. Well, somebody's going to have to have a conversation with the UK government and public, uh, public authorities in the UK. And that would be in part people like Funmi and myself, but it also needs to be players like the European Union, African government, et cetera. So that's the third. The fourth, I, we need to use resources as leverage. Now, the European Union can use its existing resources to the AU as saying, here's what we will ring fence for these purposes if African governments match. But we could use that similarly to effectively do that with philanthropic resources. Imagine if Ford Foundation or the MasterCard Foundation said, we will do A, B, and C, but only if there is a matching thing. And they don't have to only do it with in relation to African governments. They can do it also in relation to, it, to players like the European Union or the UK or North America or the Chinese government, et cetera. And it seems to me, finally, we need to start thinking and really seriously thinking about taxing uh, multinationals on the continent. I mean, all you have to do is if you go into the UK when, we, when they privatized water, they put a tax on the, on, on, on the privatized companies to invest in research in water. Why can't we do that to mining companies on the African continent? Why can't the AU, EU, and perhaps uh, associated agencies in the UN system say a tax of so much on companies, mining companies, to make an equivalent investment in laboratories that address climate change. After that, after all, that's exactly where part of the problem lies on the continent. So it seems to me imaginative public policy that corrals private resources through public investments may be the kinds of things that we are uh, talking about. But it does require imagination and it's going to require courage and it requires transcending an ideological rigidity that seems to have informed the engagements uh, on Africa. Look, Adam, I mean, uh, yes, please, Nana. Yeah, for me, let, let, let me add that, of course, as universities, we are required to produce uh, new knowledge. And for us to get the required attention, it's important that we do so, especially in areas that are fundamental to our growth as a society. And as a continent, let's talk about agriculture, health, poverty eradication, illiteracy, urban management, and so on. And these are the things that connect us more intimately with our communities. And uh, Barnabas talked about Agenda 2063. This is in line with Agenda 2063, uh, which talks about people-centered development, gender equality, youth empowerment, and so on. And it's also important that we really collaborate. Uh, Adams did mention that, you know, that's where we need our African centers of excellence, our cross campus doctoral schools, and we need to leverage on technology for our benefits. I mean, COVID has taught us a few things and we don't have to throw all of those away and then go back to business as, as usual. There, there is a lot more that we can leverage on technology and share as universities on, on this continent. I believe that when we have strong uh, collaborations, when we have strong consortiums as African universities, 
we will be better placed to uh, articulate our, our needs so that we get the, the needed support. And of course, I mean, it also allows us to go into co-equal partnerships with uh, European universities. And then this permits the co-creation, co-development of research, teaching, and uh, training enterprises right from conception through to delivery. Nana, thank you so much. Thank you so, so very much. As Vine, were you trying to add something? I... Yeah, I think that we really need to think in a different ways than we've done before. At the same time, we have some excellent, how to say, examples that could be pursued uh, for more than it has been. At University of Oslo, we have something called the Health Information System Program. It's uh, from its start 30 years ago. It has grown to benefit 2 billion people in 73 countries. And it's based on university to university collaboration, developing master's and PhD programs in health informatics in several countries, South Africa, Mozambique, Malawi, Tanzania, Ethiopia. It's been hundreds of candidates that over two decades has been involved in research and also developing a, a free public good platform. Today, many of these have developed professional initiatives in their countries, NGOs, companies supporting the platform. Uh, implementation. So I think that to, to have the type of, of uh, instruments financially that support these type of initiatives are important. And I believe that the Center of Excellence Initiative is one of these that can be a driver, not only for intra-African collaboration, because I mean, the suggestion that it involves three universities on the African continent, three, three different countries, and also at the same time, three European kind of universities, three different countries. So to build on some of the suggestions from the Gilda Rua paper, I think it's a good way forward to strengthen what is already good, but really we need to, to, uh, to, to put more emphasis in it. And I also strongly believe if you look into the future in the power of the students, I think that we need really to, to, to use students and young researchers also to, to, to create a platform for more equitable co collaboration. I mean, uh, you often say uh, a sentence that I remember from me, you, see, you say that our students should be able to see the world through the eyes of another. And then this is extremely important for what we are going to do in the future, I believe. Excellent. I Excellent. This conversation has taken, uh, you know, it, it's it's taking a kind of direction where we're converging towards the kind of ideas and lessons learning from our own, uh, from the experiences of our rectors and, and vice chancellors in this room. But I think even more importantly, certain ideas are emerging. And I want to run through a couple of things that I hear before I then ask you a question that has been directed to you, Adam. And in doing this, I want to just, you know, please bear with me. My own observation is that there's often been a hierarchy, all right, a hierarchy of people and participants in this Africa uh, EU processes. And really the, the loop we need to close, to my mind, is the loop uh, that really is a bit of a lukewarmness by the government in Africa, not all of them by many governments in Africa when it comes to research. And I think we've alluded to that already. And therefore, this is a moment of opportunity uh, and it's emerging because of this Arua Guild uh, collaboration and this conversation to close that loop by ensuring that let's accept there's a hierarchy. If a couple of vice chancellors, African vice chancellors here were to go to the African Union and try to do the advocacy that Nana was talking about, they probably will be warmly received, um, but nothing emerges after that, okay? Now, if a couple of our European rectors here and a couple of African vice chancellors went there, it probably will be, they probably will be warmly received as well, even with a, with a press release saying that they came, all right? But nothing still might happen. And I'm saying this not just tongue in cheek, but I'm trying I'm deliberately being critical to push us to the next level because I know the AU has a lot of strong policies. They've also made a lot of commitment on paper, the Pan-African University, all of those things, but we are not, we're punching below our weight. And so what I'm taking from what you're saying is that if we accept that hierarchy as a given, and that the EU and its investment is taken seriously by African government and the African Union at the center of that. If we did what I've heard you say here, 
Um, take that, insist on matching funds uh, before the final, before in fact the ink is on paper uh, in order to address that upfront, but also bring around the table industry uh, as well as philanthropy in order to mass our you know, weight, all our effort in the areas that we see as priority, we will be turning a corner. But the second thing I heard Adam say is this brain drain thing will not end for as long as some of us rely on, you know, uh, so-called um, high-performing international students, high fee-paying international students. So we keep draining the brain. We give them two-year post-work visas, three-year post-study uh, post visas, and they stay automatically. And I think, Nana, what you said about technology, uh, you know, and COVID having exposed us to new ways of doing things might be the place where we begin to do that kind of co-creation uh, that Adam was talking about. But I believe this is where our European uh, university partners, and I'm referring to myself now <laughs> as Kings and Zvine uh, and Bernd, to, you know, we need to rally around this. And Adam as well. I keep uh, still seeing Adam in Arua. I need to stop doing <laughs> that. <laughs> you now belong to the University of London. Uh, th this is where there's real work to be done to do that kind of advocacy in order to turn things around. And as I do that, I'll ask, and I think I've been given the grace of, you know, I might run over until 11.02 or thereabouts, I'll ask each one of you to think about, to pre present me with one sentence statements of if this Aurora Guild partnership were to continue and we saw the EU and AU moving towards uh, the plans that we have, that we propose, what is your single, what is the one thing that you would put on the table as a priority uh, when that happens? Please think about it. But Adam, there's a question for you. Uh, it says, Professor Habib, the metaphor you used is very powerful, learning to swim together or we shall sink together. Could you illustrate this perspective on South-North, South research collaboration, uh, e.g. with a specific example, for instance, with regard to climate change, food security or pandemics? I kind of think uh, you've done this. I don't want you to spend too much uh, time on that. Uh, but I will start with you uh, with that closing statement about what your priority will be for the future. So uh, my, if I was going to do one thing uh, in, in, as a vice chancellor in a European or a British institution, it would be to say, can we launch with appropriate partners of the African continent, a master's and PhD program jointly co-curriculated, co-taught and co-credentialed in either the areas of climate change or pandemics or related areas with appropriate investments in the resources, both in library resources and laboratory resources. That, that's what I would do immediately. If I was a government uh, official in the European Union, I'd make sure that the next negotiation with the African Union has a ring fenced amount. And secondly, if I was sitting in the European Parliament, I would argue for a co-convened conference, as you suggested, after that, that brings African governments, European governments, African businesses on the continent and philanthropy for a major global fund on investment into universities uh, infrastructure. Adam, thank you so very much. Thank you. I'm now going in the order in which I see you on my screen. Um, Nana, over to you. Yeah, thank you. And I'm glad you picked me after Adam because he's, he spoke just what I had noted down. I had said that I noted co-creation of curricula for our postgraduate programs, sharing resources, particularly using technology. Indeed, the task is enormous. Taking these up as individual universities can be daunting. We have common challenges and interests. So being in alliances like these, Arua Guild should provide the avenue for joint ownership of research and teaching endeavors. Thank you. Thank you so much. Asvain, over to you. I think co-creation is really uh, the important word here. Uh, a very efficient way to secure further deepening of the collaboration and the co-creation was is to fund the, fund the Gilda Rua Centers of Excellence initiative, I think. 
at least three universities at the African continent, at least three at the European, and enable these universities together build a strong partnership that will also involve uh, uh, co-created uh, co uh, PhD programs, postdoctor programs, and so on, dedicated to long-term partnership. I think that would be excellent. Three. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bern? Yeah, this is also very important for me, the long-term investment in strengthening the excellent research at African universities, and of course, in cooperation between African and European universities. But what is very important for me is that we have a funding program, a system on a supranational level, so that the different uh, national states involved, for example, in the African Union or in the European Union, uh, get into a kind of competition in funding, research, and uh, higher education. And that is only be possible if we uh, really negotiate these uh, funding programs on a supranational level. Excellent, thank you. And last, uh, but certainly not least, um, Barnabas Namange. Oh, you're, you're muted, I think, you're muted. Uh, sorry, I was saying that as the current chair of Arua, I would say that we would do a good thing if we put in place a program for enhancing the capacity for research and the research management, especially uh, at the, the Arua universities, uh, anchoring into centers of excellence and probably putting in place even more centers of excellence to which now the other younger universities can also anchor. I think we'll have done a great job. I agree with you. I agree with you very much. Uh, let me say what a privilege it has been uh, to chair, you know, these eminent professors that I have great respect for and I've, uh, I collaborate with in different ways. And I think we've had the quality of discussion uh, that should continue and should take us to the next level as we press for the first time, you know, far more seriously than we have in the past. Um, you know, this collaboration between Europe and Africa in a way that is equitable, that puts universities and research at the center of it. Thank you so very much. Uh, thanks for permitting me to finish at 11.02, uh, Jan Pavoski. Uh, thanks to all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much to our panel. And um, also from us here in Brussels, thank you so much to all of you for an, a really excellent discussion. And we will certainly take back this issue to our policymakers. So I think this has been a, a discussion really at three levels and I won't uh, attempt to sum up, but, but really um, you, you have all really, of course, in a conference, it's, it is about talking, but you've very much talked about how we walk the walk. And uh, I thank you for that. Uh, you thought, talked about this at the level of institutions, about how we, we need to challenge ourselves to doing things differently. You've talked about this in terms of the upcoming AU-EU conference, but what I think will be also really important to take to policymakers also is this idea of then um, thinking about how to bring other actors in the system um, uh, uh, to the table so that we don't just, that we really um, ensure that we don't just uh, leave discussions uh, petering out with intentions of goodwill. The EU is already putting in a lot more resources, as we, I'm sure we'll hear soon, into uh, project to project uh, funding to, to accompany this. So it's a very good moment. But of course, we need to really step up the game at so many levels. Uh, and the time is right for that. Thank you very much, distinguished panel. And uh, we will now have a short break um, for 20 minutes exactly. So we will meet at, again at 25 past the hour. Uh, and I look forward to the discussion where we talk about um, a number of distinguished researchers about what they uh, need to see uh, to be done differently in order to really boost the capacity of uh, African research universities. And that will then be followed by a, a, a hugely eminent and important panel of policymakers uh, as they contemplate and as they plan for the next uh, AU EU summit in February. Thank you very much. Welcome, welcome back, uh, colleagues, um, distinguished participants, uh, to the second part of our conference. Um, we, uh, just to recap in the briefest possible ways on what we've heard uh, in the first part of the conference, we uh, began with uh, listening to um, Commissioner, Her Excellency Commissioner 
uh, Akwa, who really emphasized the importance of universities in, in the interdisciplinary research they do at the crossroads, at the intersections of uh, different parts of society, be it um, uh, which brings together entrepreneurs, industry, um, startups, um, students, um, and civil society leaders and non uh, government organizations. And she urged, she spoke with a real sense of urgency that we really need to um, rise to the challenge to strengthen um, African universities to meet the goals of the AU's 2063 agenda. This is followed by um, a presentation by Nico Klut and um, Peter Maaßen, where they demonstrated the huge capacity, the huge potential of African research universities that have, that have, that have increased their share of world publications, however, at relatively low levels. And we were reminded of this in a later panel um, when we, uh, if we compare, you know, Africa and China in terms of their, which are comparable in terms of their population size, um, then the, then the inequalities um, uh, of, of uh, or the ways in which African universities are lagging behind in terms of their output of PhD students was really quite, uh, is really uh, remarkable and a huge cause for concern. Um, this was followed by um, uh, Catherine Gila's um, um, urge to, of, of, uh, um, uh, response uh, for an integral approach amongst universities where she really outlined what, what an integral approach for universities could look like in terms of investing in infrastructure, research management, open science, uh, strengthening university leaderships and uh, laboratories. And we then had a panel of vice chancellors really thinking through in very concrete terms how we could um, have a, an institutional, um, how we could really strengthen uh, universities in very, very practical uh, terms to respond to um, Commissioner Agbo's, um demand that universities and we all learn to walk the walk when it comes to strengthening African science. And there were th three core points that, that came out for me. Um, one was that they um, urged, the, the, the vice chancellors and university leaders urged an institutional co-creation of our degrees, of PhD trainings, but also of our laboratories and access to, uh, to uh, publications. Um, second, they urged um, an AU-EU commitment at, at the next AU-EU summit to strengthen universities, but that this needs to be match funded by national funding as well, by, by commitment of amongst um, national, um, uh, amongst African countries uh, to, to uh, support universities through national funding as a proportion of GDP. And finally, they, are, they urge that before the ink is dry on any AU-EU uh, agreement, there should also be a summit, a follow-up summit um, amongst uh, between amongst political leaders, but also of multinationals and philanthropic organizations to really um, develop and share a common vision uh, to support uh, research. Um, so to, and, and in that way to really uh, create a step change in the way in which universities and science are supported. We are now uh, very pleased now to introduce our next uh, panel of uh, distinguished researchers. Who are, uh, who are going to discuss how, from their perspective, um, research uh, can be strengthened in new innovative ways, um, noting that our previous panel really said or urged us to really think complete, in completely different ways uh, and to really do things uh, differently so that we can do things uh, better. And so I'm delighted to welcome on this panel uh, Arma de Graaf Aikens, who is professor of the University of uh, Ghana. Uh, and who's currently visiting fellow at the University College London. Um, Murray Leibrand, professor at the University of Cape Town. Uh, Matza Mipando, who's professor and principal of the College of Medicine at the University of Malawi. Uh, Dean and Rhoda, Dean Rhoda Wayenza, who is professor and dean of Makerere University School of Public Health. And um, moderating this wonderful a panel of very distinguished uh, speakers is Paul Garside, who is professor of basic immuno immunology at the University of Glasgow. Paul, and with that, I hand over to you. Thank you all for joining us. Thanks very much, Jan, and thanks for introducing everybody and setting the scene, and also uh, inviting me to participate in what has already been a a fantastic uh, meeting this morning with lots of uh, incredibly important points raised. So welcome to our uh, very distinguished panel here. Um, so thank you all for joining us and uh, I'll press on now. Uh, Jan has already uh, introduced you uh, and I know there's been a, a, a slight change in name 
uh, of institution for one of you. So just to note before we start that uh, Mopatsa Mopando uh, hasn't changed his own name, uh, but the name of his, his institution has changed. So uh, it's now called Kamuzu University of Health Sciences and uh, Mopatsa can elaborate on that uh, in a while if he wishes to. So I thought I'd start, uh, just go around you and start with some questions for each of you, and just to, to warn you, uh, Emma, I will probably come to you first here, uh, and then I'll ask you each a question, uh, ask you for a, a few minutes of an answer on that, and then we'll have a group discussion of that, and I have a few questions that we can pick up on that, and also as we go on through the session, we'll see some questions appear in the, in the Q&A, and we'll, we'll try and select uh, some of those for you to, to talk about as well. So, uh, Emma, first to you, so you're a professor, at the University of Ghana and uh, currently on a British Academy Global Professorship in London to do a social psychological study on chronic illness and systems of care in London's West African communities. Um, so I guess from, from, from your own experience, how can African researchers contribute to European science and how can our understanding shift through collaborations across continents? Thank you, Paul. Um, I mean, to answer the first part of the question, I'll start with a quote um, from a 20 year old book titled Africa and the Disciplines, edited by Robert Bates, V.Y. Medumbe, and Gino Barr. The editors assert, and I quote, some social sciences rest solidly on foundations built in significant part of African materials, end quote. So in this book, um, researchers um, illustrate the assertion with examples from anthropology, economics, political science, art history, and other disciplines. Um, they highlight how popular concepts across the social sciences and humanities, such as local knowledge, the household, the tribe, labor migration, custom, and magic, were developed through research by Euro-American researchers in African communities. In medicine, um, the concept of a walking pathological museum arose from the fascination that European researchers had with a diseased African body. This is what historian Melissa Grabois outlines vividly as, and I quote, the collection of germs, pathogens, viruses, parasites, and other abnormal and unusual diseases likely to be found in a single African body. Now, this concept was also a real space um, across European medical schools in Britain, France, Belgium, and elsewhere. There were pathological museums, trainee doctors, and medical researchers who planned to work in the tropics were able to see biological specimens, bodily fluids, diseased organs, and so on, representing diseases that were unlikely to see in their own country. And obviously, these are also um, the processes that led to the development of you know, vaccines, early vaccines, for instance, in the colonial era. I mean, the complex collaborative and financing structures of global health, for instance, evolved from these colonial medical practices. So Africa's contribution um, to European sciences is well documented. Um, the question for me has always been, to what extent African materials and African collaborators from the village interpreter of early anthropological research to the university research partner of today's typical global health project are visible, acknowledged, documented, and rewarded. And to the second part of the question, how can our understanding shift through collaborations across continents? I think in three intersecting ways. I mean, firstly, I think we need to know and understand our histories. Um, European and African researchers should know their disciplinary histories. Um, they should know the historical intersections between local African realities and global knowledge production. So that we deepen our understanding of the roots of unequal partnerships of today and funding models, and we can sort of develop practical solutions. Second, we must commit to long-term issue-based partnerships and building equitable communities of practice. Um, and through this kind of engagement, we can build alliances that strengthen research um, and capacities across research spaces, but also across local communities. Um, finally, quick point, we need reciprocity in collaborations. I think we need to get to a future where African researchers can hop on a plane to London, um, Paris or Amsterdam to conduct research as easily as their European counterparts can hop on a plane to Accra, Nairobi and Kampala. Of course, as our VCs argued in panel one, this is an ideal that goes beyond institutions and funding organizations to European government policies um, and global politics. Thank you very much, uh, Amar. I think those are obviously all incredibly important points and uh, 
We have our own examples at the University of Glasgow in, in, in collections, historical collections from Africa uh, of, of viruses uh, in which you know, the, the recognition of everybody that commuted, uh, contributed to that work is incredibly important. Absolutely, thank you for that. And, and uh, Murray, maybe if I could uh, move on to you. So you're a, a professor in the School of Economics at the University of Cape Town and a director of the Southern African Labour and Development Research Unit. <coughs> And they're at National Research Chair in uh, Poverty and Inequalities Research. Um, so really what I wanted to ask you is, is in your view, and, and I would ask all of the panelists to remember that I will come back to all of you with all of these questions uh, kind of at the end of this session, but I wanted to get it going this way. Um, so Murray, in your view, how, how important is it, um, uh, is, is regional African uh, collaboration? We heard a bit about this earlier this morning. And, and how, do we, how do we boost this? into African collaboration and how do we make that sustainable? Yeah, greetings uh, to all. And uh, uh, important question that flows on directly, I think, from what I was just saying in terms of the, uh, of leveraging the actual, uh, basing, basing our research and our, our recommendations to, to the policy community on African realities. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm gonna answer a little bit from the point of view of the African Research Universities Alliance. Um, and, and in particular, the work of, of the, the Center of Excellence that addresses uh, African poverty and inequality uh, challenges. So, so at the, um, um, obviously Arua's founding principles are, are such that, that African researchers and, and African uh, people must be at the center of, of thinking about African problems and African solutions to those problems and African policy making. Um, uh, but what does that actually, what does that mean in the in 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 the in practical terms? So in the poverty and inequality space, uh, what what that means is uh, is that uh, that that the realities on, on the continent are complicated and um, and not necessarily, one doesn't want to homogenize them because otherwise we're doing to ourselves what, what happens right now when African research, when Africa is spoken about by others other than ourselves. And it's quite a simple message about uh, the, the demography and about uh, inclusive growth or the lack of growth, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, so if we're gonna own that discussion, then uh, it turns out that there is a discussion to own because uh, 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 as a continent, we've had the lowest returns on a very strong period of economic growth in terms of poverty and inequality reduction of any regional space. Um, and uh, so that's, an, that's a sort of a stylized fact. But uh, the point is that if we're going to confront that uh, and, and actually deal with it, we need to get stuck in at the regional level to the specificities of how that actually happens. Why is that? Uh, there aren't simple answers to that question, but it's an absolutely crucial question moving forward. And COVID has just made it worse. Uh, basically, you need to, 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 to leverage the local specificities um, the local economies, how they've re actually worked, how they've excluded people, um, uh, etc. Et uh, so, so that, that's why it's absolutely crucial. It's it's an enterprise that has to take place across the continent. Uh, how do we boost it? Well, regional nodes of excellence um, are the way that we boost it. There are those there are those nodes. There are people. Um, doing that work, doing excellent work in the local context. And if we want to leverage then this re the across regional perspective, well, then we've got to connect these, these nodes of excellence in, a, in the work program that tries to, to reflect on the local experience and how it differs, and then to generalize from that across. Um, so uh, you need to start with these strong nodes. If it's a work program that's up and running, this can't be seen as capacity building. Uh, ideally uh, traversing the continent, uh, but obviously the issues then about uh, that have arisen about Francophone Africa, etc. Um, 
but you do need research centers to get this thing going uh, that are established and, and research institutions that the universities know how to deal with big collective research projects. Um, uh, that's a real challenge actually to this regional collaboration. Uh, that's not to deny the importance of building up research capacity, which came up this morning, but you can't, uh, there's a pressing need that we get going on this program. Uh, so that's, that's a key point. For final, a uh, few quick points in about how do you sustain this? Well, I think my, my point about building this collaboration of strong research institutions um, is the foundation for sustainability. Um, uh, but, but then there's more. I, I think that the sort of boosting phase, if you like, uh, uh, has, to be, um, has to be long enough so that the collaboration actually gets used to behaving as a collaboration, not just a setup phase, because the incentives are right now that we don't do well with this sort of collaboration. We're not leveraging this knowledge across the continent. Um, so it has to be, uh, the, the, the so-called setup phase has to be a medium run phase. Uh, and so that the centers can get used to this, this mode uh, like the big centers across the world do as, as a mode. And then, um, uh, it, and then from the supply side, get used to writing grants together, used to behaving like that. Um, and then from the demand side, I think that there's a need for the, uh, for the, the initial funders to be thinking as, of this as a very long run program too, because uh, some sort of support, it can be phased down, but some sort of commitment to this regional enterprise is going to be important over the long run. Thanks, let me stop there. Okay, thank, thanks very much, Murray. And, and I think a couple of uh, critical points there as well to pick up in, in terms of not homogenizing the, the whole continent. I think that's absolutely critical. As you say, context is key, context is everything. And then that leads on to some of the other things that you said uh, about, okay, strengthening and building capacity, but what's key to that? And I know one of the important things that Rua has done and, and the Guild is very keen on this as well, is enhancing research management. That research management is absolutely critical to everything that, that we're talking about in here, here and what to do. So no, fantastic. Thank you very much for that. So next I'll come on to, uh, to Mokwatsa. And just to ask uh, Mokwatsa, uh, from your experience as, as uh, principal of the College of Medicine, University of Malawi, that was, um, how do you think we can make international collaboration um, more sustainable? And, and I guess equally important, what, what doesn't work? What things don't work? What can we learn from that as well? Uh, thank you, Paul, and uh, thank you for the invitation to be part of this panel. Just a, uh, a few seconds to say that uh, uh, the University of Malawi delinked some of the colleges. So one of the colleges that was delinked from the University of Malawi was uh, College of Medicine and uh, Kamuzu College of Nursing to form a new university of health sciences, and that's where I belong to. Uh, it's a new baby, but we are research intensive and we want to make sure that uh, we see that growth. That is important to answer part of your, your question because we have people that have been trained, but if the environment, if they don't have an environment that uh, uh, they can sustain, we might end up losing uh, these people. So first and foremost, as we are going into discussion in terms of collaboration, there is need for a symbi what I call symbiotic partnership, where uh, a partnership that is, doesn't see the African or the uh, Western, or in our case, maybe the South African universities to be the leaders and us, we are just receiving. But if we see each other to say we can benefit from each other, I think that is very important because that respect can be very good for sustaining whatever uh, projects you are coming up with. So firstly, I do talk about symbiotic relationships. Secondly, there has to be equity in terms of the sharing of things, realizing the strengths and also the weaknesses. Uh, in our case, in a number of uh, African universities, maybe the infrastructure is not there, but if we're able to invest in an infrastructure that would attract you, Paul, from Glasgow to come and work, not to help, but to work and uh, pro, you know, progress your own research career, but you are comfortable with the infrastructure that we have. I think that is very important because that will make you to come back now and again. But if my infrastructure, my grant management, my administration, and even how I keep the samples, if you're not happy with that, you won't be encouraged to come back to us. So an investment in infrastructure that supports 
And that gives confidence to our partners is also very important. But realizing that you can also learn from us, because if you talk of malaria and other things, maybe we are the best, you might not know that. But your immunology, uh, your, your, your knowledge of immunology would be helpful to answer the issues that we have here. So that symbiotic partnership, uh, the equity and respect is very important. And I've talked about the investment and investment that goes beyond the research investment, but the support around that research is important because if we go together and uh, put a grant, whoever the funder has to also be trusting the system that I'll be able to report of what I'm doing, how I'm using the money, the accountability. And lastly, I would also want to have uh, both bottom up and uh, uh, up down in terms of having institutional agreements, because that helps that even if I move away, even if oh, you, you, you retire, that uh, sustainability of, uh, uh, of the agreement will be there. So bringing in the uh, institutional agreements becomes very important. One thing that I'm passionately thinking it shouldn't work anymore is where we have what I used to call uh, campuses, extension of campuses from West to be in Malawi or to be in Africa, where we have centers of excellence next to a dilapidated institution, which is like a, a public entity. We need to incorporate everything into the public universities rather than having a standalone independent, which is good for our colleagues that are coming, but it's not good for development of capacity for the Africans. So embedded in the institution, I think that's the way it should be, rather than setting an independent institutions around the institution where uh, you don't have a voice in terms of uh, what needs to be done. So maybe I would stop there to say to me, you need to embed, but you shouldn't continue these uh, models of having uh, extensions of Western or well-to-do universities in the continent, because that is not sustainable and you don't build capacity within us. Lastly, is just to say, we are ready, we have the people on the ground that can work and that can be respected in terms of building these centers of excellence. Uh, thank you. Thanks very much, Mopacha. And again, coming through the importance of of structures and support structures and governance and management, I think, in, in being able to key to support uh, partnerships. So thank you very much. Uh, Rhoda, uh, on to you next. And um, I was just going to ask how important you think uh, public universities have been in, the, in fighting the current uh, kind of COVID health crisis and, and maybe what can we learn uh, from that, both in terms of what's gone well and what hasn't. And then how do we best invest in the the research capacities of African universities in, in a sustainable way so that we deal with these things uh, better in, in future. Uh, thank you, uh, Paul, and I uh, appreciate the opportunity to participate in uh, this discussion. Uh, to start with, I, I think the current situation has uh, uh, truly uh, unveiled the power of uh, academic research and uh, universities in terms of contributing not only to health uh, and other disasters, but also the broader development agenda. We, we had um, a, a huge, uh, and perhaps overwhelming um, uh, participation of universities in addressing this pandemic more than we've, we've seen, uh, perhaps in other uh, uh, issues uh, before. We had a lot of scientists, even where they previously didn't exist as part of the national response strategies, co-opted to help generate evidence where it existed from other parts of the world and also to conduct local research uh, in partnership with other institutions as well as um, with the uh, you know, academic institutions, the private sector, and to come together and uh, address evidence gaps, innovations, we had, uh, for example, um, uh, a lot of research groups across universities coming in to supplement the PPEs, uh, protective uh, uh, um, uh, wear, including uh, making masks and uh, sanitizers where they were short in supply. We had people coming up with ICT technologies to do contact tracing and, and help uh, with, with the other components of the, the, the response. So there was so much, you know, coming in, including lots of efforts beginning to work on diagnostics, uh, you know, the test kits for COVID and coming up with uh, 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 therapeutics, including using local hubs, uh, uh, which are under trial and, and others beginning on vaccine uh, research. So there was a lot of effort uh, in terms of university 
uh, staff coming in to work with the ministries of health and other sectors in the response. That was really good also uh, in addition to partnerships across universities in Africa, across countries uh, to learn from one another and jointly review the response across countries. And uh, so, so it was really good uh, in, in terms of uh, 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 trying to bring in the expertise from the universities. We also had governments coming in to provide some emergency funds to answer certain questions where gaps uh, existed. So there was an opportunity also to expand funding uh, for, for research and development. Uh, in this um, uh, response. That said, um, however, I, I think that um, um, we saw a lot of um, uh, interest in government's funding research. I wish we had done this yesterday because some of the tools that we were investing in and that we wanted as a matter of urgency take years to build. It takes years uh, to build the infrastructure and the technology. It takes years to build the partnerships that you need uh, for the entire value chain for producing uh, therapeutics, diagnostics, as well as Vaccine. So here we were coming in, uh, you know, within this situation and trying to do this urgently uh, when we might have done um, uh, better, perhaps if we had invested uh, uh, earlier. So I, I think that it provides lessons for us in terms of first emphasizing the value of having research and development and investments early enough, investments in not only the infrastructure and systems, but also the human capital, because it takes years sometimes to produce people that can be able to do this. Uh, for example, we are talking about technology transfer for vaccines, but we need to have the people that can use that technology unless we are also going to import the people that are going to do it uh, in, the, in, in, you know, in the immediate um, uh, situation as we look up uh, at, at the long term. So I, I think that uh, whereas it provided an opportunity for us to demonstrate that science is important, we need to also invest in it, we need to invest early, and it needs to be comprehensive investment. I also think that if we had had perhaps better policies around the funding uh, that the governments came up with urgently, it might have also done better in terms of realigning it with the actual uh, priorities uh, of, of the issues that we needed to address uh, immediately. So I see a lot of uh, opportunities for us to build on this. Um, as governments realize that it's really important for us to have a certain level of self-sufficiency, especially in the rising uh, challenge of nationalism and inequitable sharing of scientific tools, that it's important for us to uh, focus on longer term uh, investments across systems, infrastructure, human capital, but also uh, looking at uh, in the long run, uh, building the necessary partnerships for transfer and sharing of technology early enough, whether it's across universities in Africa or with Europe, with the private sector. I think this needs to happen uh, um, much, much earlier. And we need to be thinking certainly a long term uh, in terms of investments, because it takes a very long time to get the systems where we want them to be and the people that we want to uh, build for the next uh, generation and in preparation for the next pandemic. Yep. And one other issue I need to emphasize is uh, the across generation. I know we've talked about equity and uh, we've talked about uh, uh, North and South, but I think we also need to look into equity within the research investments that we do. The next generation of scientists, the younger people are often not involved, uh, even when we have sufficient funding um, uh, within the African context. So I think we need to be looking at equity across gender, across uh, you know uh, generations uh, as we do these investments in the longer term. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Rada. And again, some very important points picked up about uh, and some of the things that the pandemic has taught us uh, that the, the, the potential uh, that for those collaborations is there and how important those collaborations and how important universities across the world have been in dealing with this. So uh, uh, rather than go back to you, and because uh, obviously in the session we're, we're a bit tight for time and I want to make sure that we involve the audience, rather than go back and ask you about the things we've just been talked about, maybe we can pick that up at the end. What one question that's come uh, from, from the audience, um, the participants, that I'd like each of you to give a relatively uh, a, a short answer to, is is the, the tension between and, and you know this is this is a tension for universities uh, all over the world, but a tension for, for some African institutions between if we're trying to push this research agenda and be a research intensive university, how do you balance that with everything else? that universities have to do. So if I'll go back around the panel again in the, in the same order again. 
So, uh, Amma, could I come to you first for a brief answer of how you think we, we might deal with uh, balancing those two uh, aspects of what universities do? Um, yeah, I mean, I think this is a really good question. Um, um, because obviously, if, for instance, Arua represents the research intent of African universities, which means these are universities that are aiming to build research capacity from graduate level up. Um, and the capacity building has to be done with academics, researchers who are actively teaching, um, doing their own research, sometimes doing admin. Um, and so there has to be some way in which institutions are able to recognize the section of the university community that is going to push the research agenda forward. And I think these are things that have to be, be worked out institution by institution thinking about the most active, I guess, academics on campus, academics who are committed to research careers. I mean, another thing I think we have to realize is that not everybody wants a research career in a university. There are some academics who are very happy teaching, supervising students, um, and just pressing on with the admin and the teaching agenda. So I think it, it, it really rests on each university to think through how they can build capacity using the existing resources they have, that's number one. But number two, I think that organizations like Arua, the Guild, you know, the, the, the sort of the, 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 the organizations that bring together a collection of universities with a common goal can think through what works and what doesn't work, right? So that that kind of supra institutional, supra national sort of approach can lead local um, decision making. Okay, thanks very much. And uh, Murray, do you have anything to, to add to that? Yes, just, just to add that, um, the, obviously this is a daunting challenge, but this is, a, this is also an opportunity, right? What, what, what research intensive universities and universities that are, are on a mission, in a sense, uh, to have, as, have that impact as universities, uh, what that brings to the university is something enormous. It brings a texture into the teaching, right? You're not just teaching out of some sort of American textbook. Uh, you're teaching about what your academics are actually doing in your country uh, to have impact um, and what they're doing in the, on the global stage and taking the African perspective out. And it, 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 uh, it, it has enormous impact on the on the tone of the institution, but it does require that the university actually wants to be like that, because uh, yeah. otherwise you get into these conflicts between okay. a dean just okay. doing their job and others. Yeah. So it, it kind of goes back to your context point again, and, and, uh, and bringing that research context into everything you do in your own university. And, yeah, okay. Right. Yeah, mm. thank you. Mopratza, do you have any, anything to add? Yes, uh, I'm lucky that I served as a principal of the College of Medicine for quite about six years, which is like the highest uh, uh, figure in there. And now I'm back being in the department. I think one of the things that I think universities in Africa need to do is like, whilst we're investing in uh, our researchers to become the best they can be in terms of globally uh, renowned, we also need to invest in the administrators because sometimes administrators can be a little bit rigid in terms of bringing in new ways of dealing with things. Now, if we were to expose them, to bring them, or even to train them and even partner them with uh, institutions where research and teaching works together, I think that we need to start coming up with policies and uh, mechanisms which will allow both research and teaching to uh, go hand in hand. You need the research for the ranking, for the more grants to come, but you also need the students for the money in terms of uh, uh, the fees that are there. So they have to work hand in hand in there. What I've noted most of the time, our administrators, they are more into academic, I mean, in terms of undergraduate teaching, and uh, they put the research maybe a little bit far. But I will give you an example here at our college where we have uh, a, a trajectory where somebody can be a researcher and uh, you can buy some time of uh, him if he's raising money or resources for the research so that you bring in somebody else who can do the teaching. But very few people take it's that list hours. to do that. Uh, so I think we need to change, we need to expose them and we need to make sure that the research, uh, those that are doing research 
we also respect them that they are part of the institution. Whilst those that are doing uh, uh, teaching, we help them to expose to the research. As uh, Male has said, they need to also to be current in terms yeah. of whatever they are teaching. Yeah. So, so I guess context is important, not only this is a con context almost on a personal level for individuals that the balance and, and as Amr already said the balance between teaching and research may be different for different people but institutions can deal with that and figure out how to deal with that yeah, absolutely uh, uh, Rhoda do you have anything to add on on this yes I do I, I actually think that um, this dichotomy perhaps is is, is is partly a mindset and I think that we need a mindset shift and, and I think the way we look at students is like they are supposed to be taught. We don't look at students as innovators and that people that are young, smart, and can add value to research. If you engaged with students with your research, you'll be amazed just how they can critique and give you new questions, even, you be, even before you begin teaching. So I personally think that this dichotomy has been exaggerated, and I think we need a mindset change. We need to be looking at students as part of research and development, people with new ideas, and depending on how we teach them and challenge them to solve problems, they can actually give us even much better ideas than we actually think ourselves. Our students lately are so exposed to technology technology, they think so innovatively. So they are not just at the receiving end, like we are going to teach them and that's a waste of time away from research. We need to integrate. That's my real thinking around this issue. And I think it needs to shift. When you do your research, you use it to teach. Students add value to your research. When you use it to teach them, you come up with new questions from your research. Uh, rather from your students, they can come up with the innovations you didn't even think about. So I think we need to rethink that as well. So it shouldn't be just a dichotomy, teaching people and those that are doing research is not going to help us. The other issue is that these students are actually the future scientists. So if we are going to divorce them from our research and we think they're just there to be taught, and then we are there to do research on the sidelines, then we are not helping that generational gap in terms of preparing the next um, generation scientists. We need to involve them in our research so that they can help us to make it better. They can learn from it. We can use it to teach them and we can get ideas from, uh, from them. We also need to rethink how we actually evaluate and reward um, uh, you know, academic uh, outputs. So it shouldn't just be something that's limited uh, to, to just um, the publications and whatever it is that we get out of the research, but we need to shift so that that also integrates how we engage with the students and use them to contribute and add value to research and innovation. So we need right. to really rethink yep. uh, the approach in terms of how we value uh, research in a research-led university vis-a-vis uh, -vis teaching. Thank yep. you. Thank you very much. So, but, so absolutely. Uh, so, so research and teaching are absolutely completely uh, integrated and important. And we should make sure that our uh, most exciting and innovative researchers inspire our next generation through their teaching. And also, as you said, get the best back from all those incredibly bright young minds. So thank, thank you very much to everybody uh, for those points. Kind of moving on uh, to the next questions. And, and I wanted to go back and, and pick up uh, something that Mopatsa said. Uh, about the importance of a conducive environment to return to. Uh, and one of the ways of, of, of dealing with this problem of, of uh, scientists, researchers, academics, people working in the administration of universities, not coming back to the continent of Africa. Um, and, and this, is, this is, uh, has been a big challenge. Um, so I think Mopatsa, you would acknowledge that this is a problem and you, you raise the problem how do we deal with that? And, and are there examples of, of where that has worked, for example, uh, in Malawi? And, and uh, does that make a difference if you, if you change that environment? Yes, uh, I, I think it, it has worked. Uh, we had a big investment by the Norwegian government where we trained a number of people going outside. Uh, we discussed together. Uh, I would say out of about 47 uh, uh, postgraduate people that we sent, I think we only lost two, if not three. One of the things that we did was on their coming back, we had put in uh, grantly entry so that they should help them to set up uh, questions. We had put in uh, funding for travel grants so that they can go to Western universities to come up with uh, uh, a proposal that they would come and work in Malawi. But also, uh, we uh, lately we are working with University of Glasgow. I, I will say it because it's closer to my heart. Where we are putting in a laboratory 
where the, uh, the people, when they come back, they shouldn't see any difference between Malawi and where they were trained in. And asking that they should put in uh, application for grants jointly with their supervisors, which should be hosted in this particular laboratory. The hope is that that helps them to sustain whatever they were working with the outsiders, but they have an environment back home where they feel that uh, they are respected. Uh, um, uh, I think that should work. Uh, similarly, we have other centers which we are hoping that we can use uh, for uh, different uh, diseases that they can work on. So if the investment is right, if we give them time, if you have these postdoc places that in the past they were not there, but now people can come and work on postdoctoral places, I think we could uh, retain the people within the uh, environment. And we also, it helps to attract the supervisors, the professors from other parts to come to work at this area where the infrastructure they can trust. Okay, thanks very much, Mokratsa. Uh, so obviously uh, that conducive environment is key. Mar Murray, if I could turn to you kind of on a, on a related point to that. You know, it, it, if I'm in an institution uh, in the North and it's a big institution and I, I'm trying to, and as an, an individual researcher, obviously I want to build up my own research and concentrate resource in my own group, my own institution and so on. But how, how do I reach the situation that Mokwatsu has just talked about where I make that more equitable, but obviously, as he mentioned earlier, there has to be something in it for both partners. So, so what kinds of things do you think we can do to, to create that more symbiotic relationship? Yeah, great question. And I do think that this sort of hard-nosed approach of looking at the incentives is the, is the right way to go. Uh, but in, uh, in saying that, I think it's important to recognize that it's, it's not just about the individual researcher, because that's not how the individual researcher in the North generally uh, locates themselves, they locate themselves in an institution. So it's the institutional um, structures and incentives that count too, and it's, and it's both of those. Um, so, uh, you know, on the North side, I think that uh, we, we, we know from Arua's experience that there are many, uh, many good researchers and many good uh, research institutes that are very committed to um, to, to this enterprise of, of partnering deeply and richly and equitably. Um, uh, at the same time, it, it can't be seen as, uh, as just a capacity building, right? That, that just doesn't have the right tone and it's the right, and, and it's not really, that doesn't mean capacity building is not part of it, but capacity building is part of the partnership. So, um, so this has to work for those on, on, the, on, on the northern side. And I think that there's many, uh, there, there is, uh, there's leveraging the, the, the excellence and the local knowledge, which we've spoken about already, um, uh, that, that is genuinely uh, enriching. And, and Africa has an enormous amount to contribute to, to global international issues that are very, very pressing um, and to our own context, but it's in the partnership we've got a contribution to global knowledge. Um, uh, so local understanding is very important, but also don't forget that, the, uh, that, that local African researchers, we just had a conference on COVID and Arua's response to COVID. And it was in completely inspiring to work out how across the disciplines, African researchers have been so influential in their contexts and on the global stage in having impact uh, and so what you also get with the partnership with the African Research Institution is this connectedness to, to the, the organs of impact, to the policy community, to civil society. And so there are the grounds for making that attractive, even in a hard-nosed place. The question then becomes, okay, but the, the Northern uh, researchers, uh, are the institutions as committed to this? Uh, so, so, for example, recently with the UKRI, when they, they had this funding wobble, uh, it was a litmus test, really, of all of us, actually, because we all had to sit around the table and work out, okay, how are we going to cope with this? And, and it's something of a litmus test. Uh, from the South, that's, that's not to acknowledge that there aren't also inequities on the Southern side. Um, and they're enormous. Uh, somebody spoke already about uh, South Africa versus some of the other research institutions. And it also has to work at that level 
Um, and one needs to acknowledge the unevenness in the, in the support given to African researchers. Uh, that needs to be honestly engaged with um, because it's, it, it, it can, can, we can, you can spend all your time setting up the research instead of doing the research. So that's it. That we're back with our strengthening research infrastructure as a key point. Um, but also to pull the African researchers into these research, into bigger research projects. The mode right now, certainly in economics and many of the policy sciences, is of individual researchers who are very excellent engaging with multilateral agents as individuals rather than as a, co a collective well supported and well anchored in the institution. Thanks. Thanks very much, Murray. So maybe if we could just uh, shift slightly and um, Amma, from your perspective uh, as a researcher, what do you think are some of the, the key investments that African uh, public universities need to enable them to build some of the, the kind of research capacity uh, and infrastructure that we've just been hearing about? Yeah, thanks, Paul. I mean, I think African universities, they need to listen to what African researchers say they want. Um, and over the last decade, there's been quite a lot of research on capacity building. Um, looking at different models that work. Um, and, and across board, there are particular things African researchers say they need. They need funding, they need time, they need networks, they need headspace. And by that, I mean tangibles like peace of mind to think, reflect, create, basically. Um, and increasingly, you know, active researchers are also calling for meaningful projects you know, that engage local communities and transform societies. And as previous speakers have observed, the COVID-19 pandemic has demonstrated the urgent need for deeper relationships between research communities and lay societies and for research that translates into policies that can be implemented. I mean, I think in a previous panel, somebody talked about the SDGs and how these must play out in any anything we do in, in, in the social setting. Um, we also know that these challenges are particularly severe for early career researchers and for women um, um, in research. Um, so we know, for instance, that um, early career researchers in many African um, researchers, sorry, universities go from the PhD to teaching classes, large classes, with minimal opportunities for postdoc training or support. And we know in the European context, even a one year postdoc can make a huge difference. Um, gives you a head start in publications or getting a university job. The other thing we don't talk about also is the problems that mid-career and senior researchers face. I mean, often, and we talked about this earlier, admin duties are imposed at the precise moment when research careers are flourishing. Um, this is a kind of internal brain drain. I'd argue that's common knowledge, but we haven't really systematically researched yet. So I think public universities need to invest in institutional structures and people both within and outside university spaces that address this, this specific set of needs, really. For example, can we ring fence funding for postdoc positions and mid-career research in universities? Um, and how do we do this? Can we create incentives for research hinged on community participation or implementation science? And moving from, theory is important, yes, but moving from um, conducting research that actually has real impact um, to local communities. And lastly, I think, you know, creating social spaces that allow universities and the communities they serve to share ideas um, and to devise solutions to local problems in real time. And there are clear examples in South Africa, for instance, you know, where um, in the food space or, you know, in the, in the health and, and urban sort of um, um, well-being space, universities are out there working with local communities and I think these are the things that we need to invest in. Okay, Thanks. thank you very much. Uh, and Rhoda, uh, um, finally to you in, the, in these kind of uh, longer questions uh, with a reasonably short answer then we'll come back to the, the very short questions at the end. Um, it, we, we've heard a lot this morning about how we, we need uh, to get also to get um, African governments to contribute to research and I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on how the African Union and the European Union um, can help universities to make the argument to their local, to their national governments um, to do more to invest in research universities and how important that is uh, to build a knowledge society uh, in, in their country. 
Um, uh, thanks, Paul. So this is a very difficult subject because we've talked about it so many times for so yeah. many years uh, yeah. in terms of uh, how we can get African governments to in invest more in, in research and development. And we, we don't seem to be making, uh, you know, as much progress as we would hope for. But but I really see an opportunity in the challenges we've just had with COVID uh, in terms of getting the governments to realize that um, investing in research and development is um, is is really not only a development issue, it is a security issue, and, and we need to do something about this. And uh, perhaps now is the time for us to uh, reevaluate again what has just happened uh, within the most recent you know, challenge that we have with COVID, but also as we look through the recovery period to see um, what has really happened across countries in terms of uh, research and development. How has it really helped us? I know there is a lot of documentation going on around that, but doing it in a very purposeful way towards demonstrating the value add that we've had from this uh, uh, in COVID and, and what value addition it would actually make uh, as we recover and especially try to uh, pace up and meet the sustainable development uh, goals, uh, targets that we have perhaps um, uh, slackened because of the COVID uh, pandemic. So I think there's a real opportunity to do this in a more comprehensive way, but not just focus on funding, but also the support systems and policies uh, that make this conducive uh, uh, for us. I'll, I'll give you an example. For, a, for example, looking at um, uh, ICT infrastructure, this is so crucial for research and development lately, uh, including the partnerships that we are speaking about. But you still see governments with policies that are not supportive, investments in ICT infrastructure that are so poor that the, you know it's even a problem for me to be part of a discussion like this. You see governments that have increased the taxes on ICT technologies, for example, when we are thinking about improving research and development. So I think this needs to be done in a fairly comprehensive manner so that we can flag out those areas, those policies that are perhaps the biggest bottlenecks. But then as we speak, we also have really poor uh, uh, R&D financing policies within our countries. Uh, some of them, even when the funding uh, increases, you actually don't see the tangible uh, outputs because of the kind of policy framework that we have in place in terms of what research gets funded, who gets uh, you know, funded for how long and to do what. So I think we need to think about this and perhaps we need to think about it within the the context of open science, open sharing uh, of technology, uh, as well as uh, you know, transfer across um, universities within the countries and across uh, countries in, in, in Africa. We need to think about sustainable longer term funding, uh, for example. We need to be thinking about funding strategies, I think, that require that there is um, uh, incremental counterpart financing from countries. I know this is very controversial because it, it, it's, uh, it, it has to be handled in a very delicate manner to ensure that countries that are most disadvantaged are also not disadvantaged in terms of receiving funding that is withheld because they don't have the counterpart financing, but those can be buffered into in terms of making sure that this is done in an equitable manner, but that countries demonstrate some sense of incremental, whether it's small or whatever, counterpart financing to research and development. Okay. Yeah. That's great. Th thanks very much, Rhoda. So uh, I'll just uh, note that we're, we're rapidly running out of time. There's lots more that we can talk about. Lots of questions in the chat. Um, so and, and we're obviously so this is incredibly important by the evidence, by the, the, the fantastic discussion we've been having uh, today. So I, I'd just like to quickly round up with a couple of things that have come through to me. And the panelists can either thumbs up or nod or whatever. A couple of things that, that we mustn't homogenize. Context is key. Context is important. That conducive environment is also important to allow researchers to come home and actually support for building that environment, not only in terms of infrastructure, but also governance and management structures will also be key for developing all those, those things for, uh, for, for, for scientists to come home. And that and I would like to round up with, I think, something that Mokwatsa said. He said, you're ready. It's here. We're ready. So let's, let's get on with it. And somebody earlier, earlier this morning said, it's urgent. And I think Murray said also, this is urgent. Let's get on with this. Let's do this. So I would just like to hand back to Jan to finish the session. I would like to thank all of the, the panelists uh, for a fantastic uh, discussion and all of the, uh, the questioners in the chat for all of their questions. I think a lot of them we picked up during the discussions. Uh, and I'm sure 
um, we'll, we'll hear more of them uh, uh, through the day. So thanks very much, everybody. And Jan, back to you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you so much. Yeah. I think Jan is muted. So thank you very much, uh, dear colleagues, for this uh, fantastic uh, for this fantastic panel again. Um, and um, I'm extremely uh, grateful for these important points. Um, just uh, maybe my own um, uh, summary, also to connect it to some to the other panels, because I think it, there are a lot of things that um, were said here that. Um, pick up um, Commissioner Akbar's uh, challenge to, um, uh, to, to really think about very concrete ways in which we can uh, uh, develop a step change in, uh, in the relations between universities um, and, and foster universities. So um, number one, uh, I think that um, there is a sense in which um, there is a unique uh, opportunity here to um, uh, invest in long-term infrastructure we've seen in the pandemic i think one of the arguments was made how uh, infrastructure how in a sense the investments need to be long term into the in the capacity because that that will pay off richly later but at the same time we need to get going we need to get going uh, immediately and i think we need to start uh, um, uh, with uh, bring together scientists immediately there was an impassioned plea for strengthening inter-african collaboration because so many of the global problems, um, the problems of sustainable development, um, have very concrete local uh, manifestations that we need to respond to. Fi um, finally, I think a, a really important point was made, um, or a, a really important point was made about how we need to strengthen African universities, not just in terms of the infrastructure, but that we need to really think about um, 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 researchers at all stages in their careers, because ultimately it's the research that informs all the teaching, uh, but also it's the research that really makes the university's contribution so meaningful into society um, and into uh, economic uh, transformation. And one way, one, one way in which universities do that is, of course, through their students, and that's the, they, they are an extremely important carrier of this. And finally, I want to fin finish with a, a really important point that Arma's made, which is that in a sense, um, we need to, in Europe, look at very much at how we are indebted to, um, to African um, scholars um, um, and to, 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 to Africans in the way they have uh, sustained and supported European research. Um, and so that we need to reflect on that in our teaching, in our curriculum, but not just in curriculum, but also in the way that we that we articulate our research and and um, how and, and that is one way in which I think we also need to rearticulate our um, our uh, or, or rearticulate the, 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 the equity of the partnerships that we want to um, develop. I, so I'm now delighted to um, uh, really. Um, introduce now our final panel of speakers um, and uh, because we can now bring all the issues that our first panel has raised and the issues that our second panel has raised about the urgency that we feel um, about really um, not just talking the talk but walking the walk in terms of strengthening the African knowledge society through the ways in which universities not just increase their research capacity but also bring that into society and to the economy um, and to um, to all parts of the innovation ecosystem. Um, and so um, uh, I'm delighted uh, really to uh, be uh, joined in the, on this panel um, by uh, Carla Montesi, who is Director for, Gr for the Green and Digital Agenda at the European Commission. Um, Mahama Oedragogo, Oedragogo, who is the Acting Director for Human Resources, Science and Technology at the Commission of the African Union. And Maria Cristina Russo, um, who is Director for International Cooperation in Research and Innovation at the European Commission. So these are the policymakers who are directly involved in the preparation of the AU EU Summit. We're delighted that they, they are joining us on this panel. Um, and they are joined by Suad Aden Osman, who is the Executive Director for the Coalition for Dialogue in Africa, an organization uh, that is uh, promoting dialogue on Africa's development by bringing together uh, policymakers. And the panel will be chaired by uh, my colleague, Anas Arieti, Secretary General of the African Research University Alliance, Universities Alliance, um, and who is also, of course, the co-host of this conference. And so, Ernest, um, over to you. I thank you very, very much, Jan. Thank you. I mean, so far, I've enjoyed everything that uh, we've heard. 
and I think we're having a, a great uh, conference. Thank you very, very much. So for, for this panel, uh, we, we note that the, with the EU's, uh, AU's Agenda 2063 and the European Union Strategy for Africa, both continents have committed in recent years to investments in excellent higher education and research as instruments and products of a strong African knowledge society. However, with the COVID-19 pandemic hitting the world from 2019, the relations between the EU and the AU seem to have slowed down considerably. Uh, the EU and the AU summit was postponed repeatedly, while views over the global response to the pandemic appeared increasingly divergent between the two continents. Now that the AU and the EU summit is eventually rescheduled for February 2022, what role uh, will research play in the AU's Agenda 2063 and the green and digital transition in the European Union? How has the economic human and scientific impact of COVID-19 affected political priorities in the AU and in the EU uh, in building up a new strategic partnership? What can we learn from mistakes made in the past? So these are the questions that our panel uh, is going to uh, help us to sort of address. Uh, there are questions that are of importance. And we've also seen from the discussions in the first two panels, and there are a number of outstanding issues that require considerable, considerable input from the African Union and from the European Union. So to help me discuss these things, the eminent panel has been introduced to you by Jean. Uh, we have our first uh, panelist, uh, Carla Montesi, uh, who will be uh, 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 answering the first question and then followed by uh, Mahama Widraugo and then Maria Christina Russo in that order, and then Suad Aden Osman. So, Carla, in September, the European Commission President von Leiden uh, announced a new strategy for global gateway partnerships, uh, more or less signaling her desire to prioritize Africa uh, in this context. Can you tell us what does this new global gateway uh, partnership mean, and what is the role of universities? A central knowledge leaders in all of this. Thank you, Ernest. And um, allow me to start by saying that I'm very happy to join this panel because, uh, of course, our work on science, research, and higher education is uh, a strategic pillar of our African Union, European Union strategic partnership. And allow me just to start with what you said in your introduction, that our cooperation was slowing down during, uh, during the COVID pandemic, just to uh, reconfirm to you that this was absolutely not the case. During all the COVID pandemic, the European Union really was absolutely engaged also to support our partner countries in facing the economic and the health crisis taken in COVID. And uh, it was a really huge answer with more than uh, 39 billion euro engaged to support our partner countries uh, to support the crisis. It was just the summit that was delayed until, as you mentioned, next February, uh, just because for the health conditions. But our partnership is still full there and we are absolutely engaged. We have also started to prepare our future partnership for the period 21-27. Now, on your question, uh, you indeed mentioned the fact that our president van der Leyen mentioned uh, that in the State of Union speech, it's a the speech for that indicated the priorities for the European Union that uh, we will have uh, by the end of the year a new strategy to connect the world that was called the Global Gateway. Now, it's really too early to talk about this because uh, work is uh, still in progress. Uh, but what I can say in a nutshell and very shortly, that this global gateway will be a strategy to enhance connectivity, connectivity investment and the connectivity services around the world. And just to indicate to you the priority for our African partnership, as you know, immediately our president mentioned that she wants to emphasize the 
priority on connectivity with our African continent because you are the first partner for us. When we are mentioning connectivity, without going in much detail, but of course, when we talk about connectivity, we're talking about promoting investment, investment in hard investment, like infrastructure, in energy, digital transport, but also on soft infrastructure. And when we look to the soft infrastructure, clearly we include the people-to-people -people exchange including research and innovation partnership for us are clearly part of the soft uh, connectivity. Uh, allow me to say that we really believe that uh, and the, all the previous debate were the, was demonstrated in this that uh, academia, research, innovation actors, civil society really contributed to the global agenda on climate, on biodiversity, on health, on education, innovation. And uh, I just came back from Glasgow and I can tell you that the presence, uh, we all see the very important role of uh, research and innovation also in our partner countries. So this subject, it's a clear priority. It's a clear priority uh, for the future of our work. Now I cannot, as I was saying, I cannot deepen very much uh, uh, the content of the global getaway because uh, it's uh, still a work on progress. But what I can tell that um, in this global gateway, we will reflect on the main strategy uh, that strategies that we have already with uh, discussed with our partners in African Union and with our African partners. The, the, the global aim will continue to be to support Africa to advance on its objective of a prosperous Africa based, of course, on inclusive growth and the sustainable development. Now, just to enter in a little more detail on this priority to foster educational exchange, to enhance learning and the knowledge and the skills. What I can tell uh, as just an example is uh, for the next future, we have uh, uh, really proposed to expand and capitalize on the networks of talents through different programs. Can be uh, the program of Erasmus Plus or Horizon Europe, Maria Cristina will talk more about this, but uh, the, the importance is really to share ideas, to share know-how. And for example, for Erasmus Plus program, I can already announce that we have uh, increased our future support for uh, this academic cooperation in, uh, within the Erasmus Plus program for the period 2021-2027. Our budget for Africa will triple. So, the amount uh, that will be just dedicated to the sub Saharan Africa alone will be uh, around 570 million for the next six years. So, you can clearly see the engagement that we are putting into this. Uh, we also set up a new Intra Africa Academy mobility schemes to support the cooperation between higher education institutions. And of course, as one other example that I can mention is that we will be um, uh, increase uh, our support to the pilot program Arise, that will be a program that will support younger uh, researcher. So you, you can see a lot of initiative. Uh, and allow me to say that really we count uh, on university to be active players. Uh, I think the university in, in our Africa continent can play an important role also in fostering this people-to-people -people connectivity between Africa and, and Europe. Uh, for example, just encouraging mobility of students and the staff or building uh, and in, on this, we can support reliable and sustainable digital system that span the African continent in the educational sector. But also maybe focusing uh, a little deeper in a deeper way, uh, research and innovation cooperation, 
focusing on target research and innovation cooperation. And this will uh, allow, of course, uh, to increase access to the Horizon Europe program and the research, but also to increase the participation of the different academy and uh, um, African university, also to all the activities that will be organized and will be supported under our global, global Europe financial instrument. So, a lot of new initiative in front of us that will allow us to deepen the first experience in the previous period, but also increase our support on everything that will be know-how, increase um, cooperation with university and with all the research and the innovation work. I stop here for the moment and uh, ready to answer to other questions. Over to you, Ernest. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Carla. Thank you very, very much. It's always nice to hear that uh, the European Union's interest in, in Africa is growing and that the commitment that the uh, Commission President expressed uh, is going to be carried forward in, in the ways that you've outlined, that the uh, amounts to be spent on uh, Africa will grow. And uh, it's given us good examples with the uh, Horizon Europe and so on. So thank you very, very much for that. Uh, let, my, my next question goes to uh, Mr. Mahama Widrago. Uh, Mahama Widrago is the Acting Director for Human Resources, Science and Technology at the African Union Commission. And uh, uh, so he's very well placed to uh, look at issues uh, of how the African Union intends to support the growth uh, and uh, diversification of the higher education system here in the region. So my, my question for you, Mahama, is how can we strengthen the role of universities in achieving the African Union's 2063 vision? How can the African Union work with African universities to make this a reality? Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Ernest. I hope you hear me very well. Yes, I do. Uh, good. Okay. Um, yeah, my name is uh, uh, Mahama Udrawo, uh, Dr. Mahama Udrawo. Actually, I am the, the director of uh, um, the Department of Education, Science, Technology, and Innovation, uh, because um, within the reform in the in the African Union, uh, now the department has changed from uh, HRST to ESTI, uh, Education, Science, Technology, and Innovation Department. Um, <clears throat> I was following, of course, you know, uh, the first and even the second panel, and I find the debate to be uh, very, very informative and very, very useful, uh, particularly as regard to, to really how science, uh, I mean, education, science and technology, uh, and their role in really achieving Agenda 2063. And if I have to say one word, I will say that they are key. They are key. And at that level, the head of state, when they adopted Agenda 2063, they came up with a strong commitment to use education, science, and technology as a prerequisite to really ensure that they can attain Agenda 2063. So this is uh, the commitment uh, from the member states, from the head of state, which is a very good uh, uh, commitment. But uh, like what the commissioner was saying, Commitment, political commitment in itself is not enough. You need to move on to really implementation, uh, come up with specific uh, plan action that you really undertake has um, to, to, to really buttress uh, the commitment you have made. And this is where, uh, at the level of uh, uh, African Union, uh, we are. And we are happy to really be working with uh, the European Commission and at hand to really work. Uh, because you know the issues are pretty much similar. Uh, they may be presented a little bit different, but um, the issue uh, remains the same. How to arrive to arrive at science? Uh, the best way to arrive at science is to ensure that you have um, a good and functional university system that can, first of all, teach um, the right amount of education, the right curricula to uh, these learners, uh, so that they can be vibrant professional and researcher to contribute to, uh, to the development of, or, or I should say, to, to be able to, to undertake research to address the challenges we are facing. And, and, and we, we, we also understand that they need to go beyond that and also contribute to 
pushing the barrier of, of knowledge, uh, which means uh, really doing uh, research for the sake of um, providing uh, more knowledge and more information that may not be readily available, but could uh, later be useful for human uh, kind and its, uh, uh, in its endeavors. Agenda, <clears throat> within Agenda 2063, we have uh, uh, the STISA, which is the Science, Technology, um, and Innovation Strategy for Africa, which was uh, really adopted to accelerate Africa's transition to an innovation-led, uh, knowledge-based economy. This is uh, very, very critical. Agenda 2063, in itself, called for the transformation of Africa. And we believe that this can be achieved if the different major sectors dear to the African economy are really taken into consideration. We need to transform African agriculture. And the only way we can do that is through science, irrigation, mechanization, and transformation of agricultural products are very, very important things that really have to be out there and prominent in uh, the university's agenda as they are preparing uh, those professionals to really uh, uh, bring forth the issue that concern uh, Africa. And if you take, you know, the majority of African countries are basically agricultural based. So it will be very good to really invest in, in those areas. The use of science to really move uh, uh, our science, I mean, our agricultural agenda forward. And university are really the key to be able to, 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 to achieve that. The transformation of agricultural produce can also be a, 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 a basis really to, to, to create entrepreneurship and to, which can contribute to the African industrialization we are all looking for. Because without the industrialization of Africa, it will be very, very difficult. And one of the, the factors on Agenda 2060 is, of course, to accelerate Africa's industrialization, to create the job, the income, for the African youth. And this is something that we really have in common with uh, the, <clears throat> the, the, the European partners. Because if we make Africa the Eldorado for African youth, we will see that they will contribute not only to the development of, of Africa, but also uh, worldwide. And will be lesser of the hindrance to, uh, through other means of uh, what we call uh, illegal uh, immigration and so forth. So I think that we can use education and research to ensure also that our mineral, our mineral resources, and Africa is very rich in mineral resources. Uh, some of the raw materials are also transformed uh, locally. And this could contribute to more uh, entrepreneurship, more job creation, and this is very neat. The other uh, sector I want to touch base on concern really uh, traditional medicine, and of course, there are many others. When you take traditional medicine, uh, in Africa, between 75 and, and 8 percent of Africans use plants and traditional medicine for their medical needs. It means that there is something really that we can harvest, and, it, and the university can play a key role in that area with the support of the different partners that, to ensure that that sector is really moved forward. Uh, for, for, for instance, when we, when we had the, the breakout of COVID-19, we have seen so many uh, candidates, uh, medication against, uh, 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 against COVID in many African countries. It's good to, to, to know what is the effect of these candidates' uh, medicine. How should we uh, put it forward as compared also to what we are doing in, in the vaccine? I think these things should go hand on hand so that uh, more knowledge is generated using the wealth of uh, that Africa has in the area of traditional medicine. And you can find that across all African countries and universities should really be working on to, on to those uh, thematics to, to really contribute. In, in fact, when we, when we brief the, our, <clears throat> our uh, constituency, the, the ambassadors here in Addis, this is one of the areas that, that they really uh, brought forward. And they were expecting that um, something can be done uh, urgently uh, to, to, to see uh, what is it that the potential that can contribute to, to addressing these particular health issues that uh, Africa and worldwide are facing. 
I I want to also touch base on on the continental education strategy for Africa, which is uh, the strategy that has been adopted by the, the head of state to basically ensure that um, education is at part to really contribute to the building of the capacity that we need for addressing the 2023. The, the, the key issue with uh, education in Africa, I won't go into all of them because some of them have already been uh, uh, mentioned here. But clearly one important element uh, <clears throat> is that we, the curriculum, the curricula that we are teaching in our university may need to be really reflected and updated so that it can address the need of, I should say, the private sector and all the relevant um, sector who are out there who can in return also contribute into providing our resources for the university for its sustainability. It, it, it's very, very important. Government alone cannot fund education in Africa. We need to find a way for the private sector, and it was said during the, during, during the first panel, that we need to bring this innovative way of bringing the private sector, the philanthropists, to also uh, contribute together with our partners as uh, the EU. The quality of education, uh, the skills of the graduates is, is very important. The quality of the teacher, particularly when we are talking about uh, the, uh, the, the time we are in with COVID, where we are trying to have a blending type of approach where um, uh, uh, courses will be given online and uh, also and face to face, we need to really uh, ensure that we have uh, teachers, professors who are really trained to undertake that. The issue of, for example, laboratory, how do you um, uh, do practical online? So these are critical issues that I think uh, can come in and together with our partners uh, so that uh, we can achieve it. And of course, the issue of mobility. Mobility, both for students and the academic staff, both within Africa and also in partnership with the European, very, very key. And I think that it, these are areas that we can really push into to facilitate and make sure that our university are also work class universities that can uh, also um, benefit from you know, these work class scientists and experts who are out there. For example, the African diaspora. It will be good that the diaspora be able to provide uh, courses in some of the African universities, like for example, the Pan-African University. The Pan-African University is the University of the African Union, dealing specifically with issues on science, technology, and innovation. And we believe that through cooperation, we can arrive at a situation where we can be bringing some of the diaspora to contribute, including other uh, partners with expertise who can really uh, contribute into really uh, uh, ensuring that we have very good uh, learner coming out of uh, the system. And to, to not to be too long, I want to just mention one element in which we are cooperating with the EU is on qualification. And we are really happy to see what we are using in terms of uh, the experience of the, uh, the, uh, the European partners in terms of qualification and and actually, our African qualification uh, framework, PACWA, is really uh, benefiting from that cooperation, and we really appreciate it, and we look forward to further uh, ensuring that it's something uh, that is very successful. So thank I will you. stop there, although there are many yeah. other things I need thank, to mention. Thank, thank you very much, Thank you very much, One of the things that uh, uh, come across to me, listening to you, Mahama, is that uh, we need to have a forum where the African Union and the African universities engage with each other. Uh, we, we, we currently are engaging through the European Union and the Guild, but it would be good for the Africans themselves uh, to sit down and talk. And I think that would be a very, very good. I, I hope the African Union will also be interested in that. Our next uh, speaker is uh, Maria Cristina Russo, who is the Director, Global Approach and International Cooperation in uh, Research and Innovation. Uh, the Director General for Research and Innovation at the European Commission. So uh, let's welcome uh, Maria Christina Russo. Uh, Maria, the European Union has recently agreed on a new global approach to research and innovation. Uh, it makes the international dimension an important aspect of European coordination. But it also identifies a number of strategic 
aspects for European collaboration with international partners. So the question is, what does the global approach mean for research and innovation collaboration with Africa? Thank you very much, Ernst, and good afternoon to everybody from Brussels. As you can see, it's sunny here. I'm very happy to be in this panel with my colleague and friend, Kara, with Mahama, and uh, with Suad, uh, whom I don't know, but I hope I will meet her very um, shortly. First of all, uh, um, let me pick up on what Kara already mentioned at the beginning of her intervention, and uh, Mahama also did uh, in his uh, really nice uh, and engaging words, uh, uh, highlighting the very good cooperation between the African Union and the European Union, uh, is the fact that uh, uh, during the pandemic, during the COVID crisis, uh, we have not slowed down the cooperation with the African Union. On the contrary, we have really taken this occasion uh, in order to beef up this cooperation and to use this uh, framework of uh, EU-African Union cooperation to do something that we had not done uh, beforehand, in particular, and uh, Mahama knows very well because we do everything hand in hand, we have organized the first ever ministerial meeting of research and innovation ministers uh, of the European Union and the African Union. That was done in July last year, and it is really a very, very important event um, for two things. First of all, it's, it's uh, from a policy point of view. I mean, uh, how are uh, uh, ministers sitting together for the first time, discussing together how to tackle the, the COVID, both from a research innovation point of view, but also highlighting, and that uh, I will come afterwards in replying more directly to your question, the link that research innovation has with economic uh, development and growth. But also uh, this discussion allowed to take stock of the very good progress that uh, we have done in our cooperation with the African Union, to the high level policy dialogue, which is a, a specific instrument that we have in place for more than 10 years, in which we discuss together policy agenda in terms of research innovation and the concrete actions. And uh, we have uh, this uh, dialogue in the field of uh, um, food, sustainable nutrition and agriculture, climate change and energy, innovation, and we have also a very important partnership uh, with Africa on health. But then uh, this uh, ministerial meeting not only uh, brought all these subjects at the highest political level, but uh, paved the way also to, um, to take the steps for the way forward, which in fact have resulted to the fact that in the new research and innovation program of the European Union, uh, Horizon Europe, and let me recall here that we have in the European Union the biggest multilateral research and innovation program of the world, which is completely open to the participation of uh, research institutes and universities from third countries. So in the Horizon Europe, we have a dedicated um, action which uh, is uh, targeting Africa as a key partner for the EU with uh, uh, around uh, uh, 36 uh, specific topics which uh, translate the policy discussion that we had at the ministerial and mobilize 350 million of euros. So just to say that, <laughs> that for us, uh, I mean, the COVID was not at all a, a moment in which we stopped the relations with uh, the African Union or we downgraded them, but on the contrary, we upgraded them. And we count uh, also to further strengthen those relations from the point of view of research and innovation. Uh, through a, a specific initiative on innovation that we are developing uh, for the uh, next, uh, for the forthcoming summit. Now, on the global approach to research and innovation, the global approach to research and innovation is the new strategy for international cooperation in research and innovation. It uh, uh, gives the direction of the activities that uh, we are undertaking in this field, notably to, to Horizon Europe, which, as I mentioned, is our research innovation program. And in fact, it aims really at uh, using uh, better and in a more strategic way, research and innovation to uh, deliver on the commission's key priority, the priorities, the twin transition, green and digital transition, uh, 
um, enhancing cooperation on important fields, in particular post-COVID, such health, and also, as I mentioned, strengthen our cooperation on innovation. But it also aims at uh, translating in a, um, in a more concrete way the political commitments that we take with our key partners in the world. And there, in fact, uh, we, in line with uh, uh, the attention that is given to research and innovation within the comprehensive strategy with Africa that was adopted at the EU level, we have a specific focus in the global approach to enhancing a cooperation with Africa in research and innovation, making effective use of the science, technology, and innovation existing in both continents, and using research and innovation in order to accelerate sustainable and inclusive development and the transition towards a knowledge-based society and economies that strengthen the human capital. So this is uh, important to say, cooperation with Africa, key element of the global approach with the aims that I just mentioned, and with targeted activities that, uh, um, that uh, translate the engagements that uh, we took during the high-level policy dialogue, during the ministerial, which also represent the key priorities of the European um, Union. Now, uh, since uh, we are here in this framework with universities, let me just uh, add a couple of uh, um, words on the participation of African universities to our activities. In fact, uh, in the previous research innovation program, uh, there was a, a slight increase of participation from African universities. Uh, the top five are universities from South Africa, Morocco, Ethiopia, Kenya, and Egypt. Uh, but uh, universities still represent a minor part of the participants uh, to uh, Horizon um, 2020, the previous program, uh, from uh, the participants from Africa, still a minor part. So I think that events like this one linking European and African universities are very important in this respect. And uh, also picking up on your comment, Ernest, to the intervention of Mahama, I think also that, uh, I, I mean, it's not up to the side, but of course we would support also a greater engagement uh, um, of, uh, of, uh, of your association within uh, the, the African Union, so that through the African Union, we can also be more mobilized in participating in our research and innovation activities. We discuss constantly with Cara and her colleagues on how um, to the um, regional program of the Global Europe uh, uh, program, we can support uh, capacity building uh, for research and innovation in order to allow the universities of Africa to have this level of uh, um, excellence, which is necessary for African universities and for European universities to participate to the Horizon Europe program. And with that, uh, I am also replying to a question that I saw in the chat about uh, uh, the use of some uh, universities uh, uh, par participants to, Horizon, uh, to the Horizon programs in order to have a closer link at governmental level. The only, question, the only reply I can give here is that uh, the uh, evaluations uh, um, on uh, participations and participants to Horizon uh, uh, Europe now and Horizon 2020 in the past are done only in, are only based on scientific excellence. So this is the criteria that uh, that we have. We have a peer review based on scientific excellence. So it's uh, important that uh, for universities to be participating to the program, they find the niche where they have the scientific excellence. They join up with the best in the world to work together in order to tackle the important and pressing societal challenges as it is described in the global approach to research and innovation. Thank, thank you very, very much, uh, Christina. So, so the, the <clears throat> I, I was very, very happy to hear you uh, uh, talk about the limited engagement uh, with African universities in the writing group. Uh, I was happy to hear what you, the programs that are being put in place to enhance that. I'm glad that you accept the need for us to support greater engagement between the African Union 
and African researchers. That's that, so we're very happy to hear all of that. We'll, we'll come back to you with more detail. But, uh, let me now turn to Swad Aden Osman. Uh, Swad is the Executive Director of Coalition for, Develop for Dialogue on Africa. Uh, she is also head of the Secretariat of the African Union High Level Panel on Illicit Financial Flows from Africa. So, Swad, you have been a, a forceful advocate for increasing STEM education in Africa over the years. You work very closely with the African Union. How can we best enhance the capacity for universities to provide the research base needed to enable a new generation of top educated graduates to help Africa's knowledge society develop? Thank you, Prof. Ariete. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm, I'm Swada de Nosman, and I, I'm happy I'm, I'm the last one to speak, Prof, because it, it's the same uh, kind of parallel conversations that we hear all the time, and we seem to have a problem linking it. It's very important that you have this conversation before European African Union and European Union talk. Um, at the end of the day, whether we like it or not, we're, that is a fantastic and strategic partnership, but whether it is an equal partnership, absolutely not. And the question is the same. Uh, we, we have been, and Africans keenly always know the challenges we are facing, and they can come up with the practical solutions to it. Uh, could, as you say, it is a coalition of individuals and institutions. Um, for the two or three aspects of our work, we build those kind of alliances and networks. And uh, ARWAF to us was one of those very rare instruments that emerged out of uh, outside, I would say, of the conventional institutional configurations that usually are bogged down by political dynamics. So I do hope that as we are going to make the plea for European Union and African Union to take into account ARWA, they do protect it. Uh, they do protect the scientists and scientific research from the usual political dynamics. It needs to, it's a unique instrument that really needs to be nurtured and protected uh, because whether we like it or not, we are going to, to end up uh, with either a not so beneficial, mutually beneficial partnerships uh, if it is not properly uh, structured and, and supported um, or because the, we, we keep hearing the same. Uh, key commitments made by our policymakers, but they are discussing key commitments along the lines of key priorities of the European Union because of the funding uh, structures, right? And pass. so at the end of the day, whether the perspective to kick societal challenges that Africans are supposed to attend to will be emerging through those kind of conversations, we are yet to see that happening. Uh, we have been trying to make sure that uh, our policymakers properly recognize that universities are the natural bedrock of research, and there will be no proper development without proper research and specific research and, and inclusive and, and, and in-depth research. So if the universities and this alliance is one of them, isn't going to be res better so resourced to lead research initiatives. We're going to come back over and over with the same issues. How are we going to properly uh, strengthen research infrastructure? Because on both sides, I'm sure we do have good researchers. There are African good researchers. There are excellent committed uh, research institutions, but whatever we do must be anchored institutionally. Now, ARWA is one of those anchors that is trying to, to protect, to present itself, and it should be positioned as such. I hope that in the upcoming conversation between European Union and this conversation, what will transpire from this since this morning, as uh, Dr. Wadrago was saying, was very informative for all of us to see how on their own, universities on the on both sides are really talking to one another and trying to sort themselves out so they need we needed to make sure uh, that we do not hamper ongoing work and ongoing efforts particularly from the african side because 
the, the strength and the organized way and heavily resourced way the European side has isn't there. And the continent is not Africa, South Africa alone. Uh, I'm also hurt when I hear Sub-Sahara Africa, Africa is Africa. We should, we should really be careful with that one because we do keep um, trying to divide this continent in, 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 in pieces that will not, the, the, Morocco is African. Uh, so we do, we do need to make sure that as we are mobilizing the, the much needed resources and they seem to, they need huge resources for Arwa, for example, to continue to drive uh, the kind of endeavors it should drive sustainably. The significant involvement of other Africans are secured. The private sector, the philanthropists, they kept saying it since this morning. Now, the private sector anywhere isn't policy makers, they are, they are profit making. So the, their interest is not to listen to, to speeches or listen to ministers platforms or what comes out of it. The, and there are other key stakeholders that recognize uh, that the, the academia is playing its important role, but they have to also be informed of what they are doing. So, we are saying that uh, in our view, in the view of CODA, uh, I am here, I've been invited and I was actually, our work was made known and we approached Arwa because we have launched in July um, an initiative to support that entire effort that on the continent and outside we're saying to improve research, development, manufacturing and distribution of essential vaccines in Africa. Of course, as Africans, we are shocked by what we have, what this pandemic to us and this opportunity cannot be lost. So all of us are pushing uh, to make sure that we come from whatever angle we're coming in from to make to, 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 to attend to these issues in a better way next time it comes around. And um, advancing the efforts of African alliances and networks like ARWA, for example, Another one that we are trying to also uh, really work with uh, in our initiative is PAMA, the Pan-African Manufacturers Association, is actually to link the work of Arwa to that of PAMA and see what the scientists are saying and what the manufacturers are hearing should be one and the same if they are, we are going to see something along the lines of attending to these numerous diseases uh, that uh, we have been dealing with. And the recognition really, uh, and this is maybe an answer to Maria earlier, uh, that Africans keenly are aware of the challenges and can easily formulate the practical solutions to it, um, will require three things. Uh, mobilizing the interest groups, uh, and ARWA is one of them, right? The researchers are an interest group when it comes to public health. And, 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 and it's not only in public health, the research in, in general um, and documentation capacities, um, and whether it is public health or taxation or, or, or industrialization, uh, agriculture, we are going through the same, the same thing. So the, the idea is that we recognize that there is effort going on. We invite these stakeholders outside of the intergovernmental processes alone, and we attend to the needs in the best way. I think that they are uh, best placed uh, to provide the much needed insights to, in order to map out the terrain of, of knowledge generation. So unless we, 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 are, we are aware that, those, that the political dynamics that are usually part of these conversations at the policy making, uh, particularly when it comes to the regional level, really needed to bring in these actors in a more meaningful way. And we do hope uh, that, uh, the, that the upcoming, uh, the upcoming uh, summit is going to mobilize the resources that uh, they need because research is, is capital intensive and, and, and researchers are all there. Uh, what, what, they don't, what, what isn't there is the properly crafted, organized drive 
from the African side that will anchor that institutionally. And I think that Arwa is better placed than any other institution at this stage uh, to, to handle that side. We do hope that uh, in, in, in going forward, um, these initiatives like, like this one and others will be really attended to and looked after uh, properly. I prefer to stop here, Prof. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very, very much, Wad. I, I, listening to you, I could sense all the, all the frustration that uh, African researchers have felt uh, over uh, many, many years. So thank you very much for bringing these out uh, to the fore. Uh, in the uh, first panel that uh, we, we listened to, uh, there were a number of proposals made made by the various speakers. One of them basically was for the need for, uh, basically, uh, uh, can the European Union uh, ring fence pending uh, in return for African commitments to spend a certain percentage of their GDP on research and innovation? Uh, is, is it possible for European Union to make that kind of uh, uh, demand? The, the, the questions are about whether uh, there could be a summit uh, a follow-up a follow -up to a, some event where which will bring together governments, uh, industry, philanthropists, uh, very much to talk along the lines that we are talking. And I saw I sort of sense the same thing in what uh, Swad was saying. Are we willing to develop some kind of forum where the philanthropists will be available because everybody has mentioned the need for them, where the, the governments will be available, where industry will be available. Uh, to discuss investment in higher education in Africa. This is something that uh, we are prepared to, to support. There's been a lot of this discussion around co-creation of joint postgraduate programs, the co-creation of the programs. The African Union has lamented today uh, the, 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 the types of curricula that we use in our universities. Uh, they've spoken quite bitterly about uh, their, their, their issues with the way we run higher education. We, we are talking about co-creation of uh, uh, programs, co-creation of curricula, co-creation of research. Uh, and so are we interested to uh, support this kind of co-creation? Um, the Arua and the Guild have over the last uh, couple of years spoken quite a bit about investing in centers of excellence, centers of excellence uh, that would enhance research capacity and research management in African universities. So African universities and European universities working together. Is there enough support for it from the African Union? Is there enough support for it from the European Union? I'll be very happy to hear your views on these things as we go around. Maybe we shall start with the Carla. Carla, I think you're muted. You're still muted. Uh, uh -huh. Okay. Okay, it's fine. Yes, and you fine. can hear me. Many, many, many thanks, Ernest, for your 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 question that allow me also to to reiterate to Saud uh, for our intervention that uh, clearly at the European Union level we we strongly believe that uh, university and especially research intensive university have a leading role clearly on the, the transition to knowledge societies and have a key role to play in, in facing all the challenges that we have, we have today. Uh, in the other side, uh, I really believe that uh, the, the policy makers uh, have never needed the research so much. We, it was already mentioned, we have seen for the COVID the pandemic, uh, how the research uh, was really, and science was really very, very important. And I can also say that it was in, from the European Union, it was not just words, it was clearly support. So I would mention, for example, the production and the, and the equitable access to vaccine and medicine and the health technologies. And I can say that from Europe, there was, uh, we, we have really very quickly react to support the manufacturing of this product on the African continent. So linking research and the linking uh, the, 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 the production. So our intervention is not just about engagement, 
is true and I can reiterate and these are not just words but are strong engagement we have reiterated also all this in in our communique after the Kigali ministerial meeting that was done last 26 October where once again from the African Union European Union we discussed how it was important and how we want to to advance in, in all the elements linked to research and innovation to drive the socioeconomic recovery, but also to increase the resilience uh, against the future crisis. Clearly, the university, once again, are at the heart in this work. And very, we can't uh, also, in answering to Saud, very much on the link between university, private sector, civil society, farmers and the farmers organization because when we look also to one of the challenges that we have on climate change it's clear that we need to move today to food the system and to move to food the system approach in all the african continent of course we need research but we need also strong dialogue between university researcher farmer farmer organization private sector so this is all the work that is necessary to do it to, to deepen in order clearly to move from the commitment to the real uh, to the real action and uh, creating supporting the emergency of this center of excellence that Ernest you mentioned it's clearly one of the key action that we would like to to support uh, because it will of course uh, very very important if we want to have this transformational approach in all this domain but it is required clearly work in both sides from the european union and 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 the african continent because really we need in uh, as you were mentioned in co-creation we need to co constructing, co-reinforcing all, for example, the training uh, program, uh, clearly engaging in a collaborative way with research and innovation uh, project. We need really to bridge research and, and, and innovation together. And this requires clearly active proaction and action from uh, and the university and the research and the innovation center. Over to you. So excellent. Thank, thank you very, very much for, for your comments. I'm very, very happy that uh, uh, you are committed to supporting the Centers of Excellence. So, so great. I mean, we, we, we will take it up and let's see how best we can work together uh, to make sure that we achieve the, uh, the objectives. Thank you very, very much. Let me go to Mahama. Mahama, any, any, your reactions to uh, the questions that I posed? I think you are muted. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Prof. I hope you hear me very well. Yeah, we hear you. Can you move closer to the microphone? Okay. Do you hear me better now? Yeah, it's okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Um, <clears throat> I, I think uh, this is um, uh, a very interesting proposal. And uh, definitely uh, from the the African side, at least at the AU, um, what we do is to, to support um, universities, center of excellence, networks, um, uh, which are really involved in ensuring that um, we can come up with uh, um, program uh, curricula that basically uh, really take into consideration uh, uh, the African uh, peculiarity. Um, I want to mention that um, while it is very important that we do that, we also have uh, centers that are already out there that we, as we are thinking about it, let's see how we can really uh, strengthen the existing one. And if you remember when I was uh, intervening, I was I mentioned the Pan African University. Uh, which is a um, university which is basically uh, <clears throat> training at master and PhD level and undertaking uh, research that need uh, a strong training. And it's basically um, uh, focusing on uh, um, science, technology, and innovation. 
There is one that is dealing with uh, uh, um, water energy, including climate change, and the one in, in uh, Clemson, Algeria. Uh, there is a hub dealing with uh, 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 social challenges and humanity based in, uh, in Yaoundé. And there is a campus uh, dealing with uh, uh, science, technology, and innovation globally. Um, I mean, basic, basic science uh, in, uh, in, in Kenya. And there is one uh, dealing with uh, life and earth science uh, based in, uh, uh, in Ibadan. And then finally, the one dealing specifically with, with space science. And when the member states created these universities, they wanted to ensure that they are really stand of excellence for Africa. And we are really, um, you know, probably we didn't do a good job into selling it, but uh, we, we, we think that it's also something to consider why we are really coming in with the idea of new center of excellence, because resources are limited, and we better really uh, use the resources to, uh, to, to train them the existing one rather than creating uh, other one, unless, you know, we can really demonstrate the need to do it. Uh, <clears throat> I think it's very important that we work together. Co-creation is, is very important. And we, we, I believe that we need to not limit ourselves to Arua, but also to existing, uh, 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 existing uh, centers, like, for example, the, uh, the Association of African University. We should also... Well, well, we, we, are, we are getting out of time. Uh, so if you could just finish it off so that uh, Christina will have, uh, Maria Christina also have a minute and so on, the minute that we close it. Okay, basically, I, I, I think uh, the, the message is there. I mean, it, it's already come across, I can limit it sure. there. Thank you. Sure. Thank you very much. Maria Christina, can you take a minute to say your last uh, suggestions? Thank you very much. Uh, I will be very short uh, because we are running out of time. And uh, what I would like to, to highlight is that uh, we have been uh, working a lot uh, on stepping up the cooperation between the EU and the African Union and Africa on the innovation, as I already mentioned, which is uh, key in all those discussions. And in fact, also um, building also on what was said by the president uh, speakers about bringing together the university and um, the, the, the researchers and the, the private sector. And uh, in this uh, framework, uh, we are supporting uh, uh, the development of uh, an African Union, European Union innovation partnership, which is based on previous uh, pilot projects and uh, advisory uh, work done by experts. And uh, that should be one of the key pillars within the African Union, European Union uh, summit, which will take place next year. So on that, uh, I think that I should conclude by highlighting that for us, it's really important that the universities are also mobilized within this uh, African Union, uh, European Union innovation partnership. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very, very much. So what? One well, minute for your last word. Thank you. No, I think that uh, we will, uh, this is all reconforting. And I think that we will continue to push to provide the platform for the involvement of both the private sector, the research, uh, and then the research community so that they can, they can continue to converse and, and bring about the solutions that we need, uh, the policymakers and the private sector. And I just wanted to, to highlight, uh, Prof. Ariete, that we should not, uh, particularly on our continent, separate private sector and philanthropy. Philanthropists are actually private sector. So the, at the end of the day, they are going to be mobilized and involved. They should be coming from one front and uh, together with the policymakers so that uh, we can make a proper sense and, and we don't continue to repeat the 20 years of pharmaceutical manufacturing in the continent that has not yielded even one vaccine when Cuba could put up one. So thank you very much for your, for your attention. Thanks, thank, thank you very much. I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, I've learned a lot from this and going forward, uh, I do hope that uh, we've all agreed that uh, uh, the international institutions uh, basically African Union, European Union, will work closely together uh, to ensure that African researchers get a much better deal, that they are able to compete globally uh, and become more effective in supporting African development. So we, we thank you very much. And let me now hand over back to Jean.
for this uh, really um, comprehensive uh, overview of the key policy objectives that you have and the policy challenges. And maybe if I, if you will allow me just to, to connect this to um, <clears throat> the uh, the first, uh, you know, the beginning of the conference, um, where we uh, where we were challenged to to really um, uh, say that. Where the African Union Commissioner challenged us to to really reimagine higher education in Africa, um, and it seems to me that as as the I'm really comfortable comforted by uh, Carla your 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 point that in some ways the EU is still thinking about the global gateway strategy because it seems to me that suggests that that's exactly what you're doing you're trying to reimagine what what a new kind of relationship might. Uh, look like. And um, one of the things that came very forcefully from the Commissioner was this idea that actually, uh, as we face our interdisciplinary challenge, challenges, we really, really do need to uh, rethink completely how we develop the capacities to do this together in partnership. Um, and uh, so I think that one of the things that's come up very strongly out of this conference to me from all the panels, uh, and we see it, heard it just now, is how actually um, we can't just rely on the AU and EU to do it alone, but that we actually, you know, in a way we would invite you to, to act as the levers to bring different societal actors, um, industry, philanthropists, private, public sector together, so that in addition to your initiatives, we also really um, acknowledge the huge contributions that other partners um, have to make in reimagining how we can strengthen the capacities, not just in research, but also in research-led education, in, in educating the next generation of people who can, in a sense, make uh, the vision of better connectedness between the two continents work. Thank you so much for your fantastic contributions, and I'll leave it with that, and I'm sure we'll be in, in, future, in further contact in the future. Thank you very much. I am uh, very grateful to all our panelists thus far, and um, we are almost coming to close, but just almost because uh, we still have um, uh, we to to concluding comments, uh, and so I'm I'm very. Uh, pleased to be able to open the floor to Njuguna Ndungu, who is the um, Executive Director of the Acon African Economic Research Consortium. And this is uh, dedicated to foster sustained development in Sub-Saharan Africa through strengthening the local capacity for conducting independent, rigorous inquiry into problems pertinent to the management of African economies. Um, and finally, I'm also then delighted to welcome for some closing reflections reflections. Uh, uh, slim Carbus, although it's not actually Slim himself, but uh, uh, Jean-Francois Lancelot, who is the Networks Director of the Association of Francophone Universities. And this is simply because uh, at, at very short notice, as these things happen, um, uh, Rector uh, Carbus was taken ill. Um, but uh, but he does represent not not only the world's largest university network um, with a very strong presence in Africa. He also has a um, perspective as a former minister of higher education of scientific research, and so we're really glad that to be joined by Jean Francois, who as networks director will speak on his behalf. But first, I want to hand over to um, uh, Njuguna. Uh, we're very honoured, Njuguna, by your presence um, and um, by your contribution, and we look forward to hearing some concluding remarks from your side about the need to strengthen science and universities and the quest for an African knowledge society by 2063. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And indeed, I'm very pleased to be invited here, uh, even though it is to make uh, closing remarks, but I enjoyed the last session. I listened to so many uh, the dimensions of the discussions. And I was very pleased that uh, at least this world, the recognition that we really need a lot of collaboration across the continent with Europe is quite interesting and, is, and also is going to produce some sustainable results. I was actually invited by Ernest to try and make uh, some closing remarks. And I also happened to, uh, let me say, to be, uh, of course, closely associated with very uh, uh, diverse uh, policymakers. But what I would like to do is, I wanted, I have made a few remarks and I wanted to make sure that I show my screen and if I'm allowed, I can show my screen so that at least um, in the in the in this, um, sorry, sorry, that is, that's the wrong screen. Uh, it happens all the time. Uh, so that what I really thought is that um, we can actually, uh, I can actually share some few ideas in terms of what we are thinking at the ARC. And uh, not on top of that, it's also to show that we have been there making some um, inroads in terms of supporting research, and uh, especially in economics. And we did believe that uh, 
if we support research in economics, we can actually maybe uh, 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 maybe in, uh, 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 allow other disciplines perhaps to replicate what we have what we've done. So let me make a few remarks and, uh, from my screen, and uh, I hope you'll excuse me. I'll not, that does not uh, imply that I'll, be, I'll take a, a, a lot of time. The first thing is that, let me talk about ARS in very brief, because uh, Ernest uh, uh, is uh, the Secretary General of Alua, but he's also the chair of uh, the African Economic Research Consortium, chair of the board. So I'm so happy that uh, at least we have some con convergence here. We at the ARC, we have uh, been building capacity in the last three years, since 1980. And we do this th through research and uh, graduate training in economics, but also, also supported by a communication and outreach uh, program for dissemination. And this is very important for us because we follow up with alumni and also we follow up with governments in terms of supplying that capacity. Can talk more about that, but for now, I just wanted to make sure that at least I also introduced the ARC. We have seen ourselves uh, collaborating with 38 universities in Sub-Saharan Africa and uh, with, that cover about uh, 24 countries. And so, and also research is, uh, has so many resource persons coming from Europe, the Americas, and even Africa itself to support our young researchers. I want to talk about three main things in terms of the, 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 the areas that I, was, uh, I, I thought it'd be important for me to share. And one of them is high skills development. And the second one is the big economy and labor market institutions. And finally, I want to talk about crossing the digital divide. What are the strategies and interventions that are required? Let me start with um, the, 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 the main aspect, human capital development and requires coordination and coherent policy interventions. And we have seen this in terms of continuum of investments in education with a focus on learning rather than teaching. And the example we have right now, we are, we are actually working on a human capital development project in Africa. And it has revealed an enormous quantity and quality gap. Then it means that human capital development means to target and strategize to close this gap. The second is research skills development. And this is what is going to help us strengthen education partnership through joint training universities, uh, university curricula, which is anchored on knowledge and knowledge and African context. And of course, we do believe that appropriate, appropriate incentives will solve even the brain brain. Most people don't seem to, un, to, to actually appreciate that. But we do believe that it is the failure of the incentives in some of our institutions that actually contribute to brain drain. Of course, example is the ARC collaborative training programs that were established since 1993. They have supported public universities in sub-Saharan Africa to mount quality degree programs. And we continue enjoying that and even seeing the fruits of that. Third, set up institutions, especially public and private, capable of developing research market in Africa. And this we know it can work and it can actually follow the ARC example and can be replicated across disciplines. But of course, ARC also suffers from the resource poor. Fourth, so many people talk about gender gap in research in Africa, and it's a persistent problem. The problem is how do we develop programs that are targeted to women? We have PTCI programs in Frankfurt, Africa, and they, have, they are showing some good examples which we can follow. Fifth, quality of data. Right now, I was in another session I was opening where we are dealing with the data, uh, uh, the, the data policy and data governance in Africa. The most important thing about the quality of data is how they are accurate and timely, disaggregated, and also widely available to researchers. And for us, that's, those are very important areas of concentration. Let me talk about uh, the, the, the high skills development. And the ARC strategic cycle has been one of the uh, perhaps promising examples. And uh, three themes, we have covered three themes in our own current planning cycle, five year planning cycle. And the first one is high quality of ARC products are very, very important. And even from research outputs to even graduate training, the quality of graduate trainings, and even the support we have for, for universities. And we believe that that high quality can create its own momentum for sustainability. And then that will allow us to develop a very strong policy platform for policy influence, especially working with the national think tanks. 
We support researchers through grants, graduates through scholarships, and even thesis grants, and our collaborating universities through institutional grants to strengthen the academic infrastructure. And so it is something that we can actually step up and it's something that can change the terrain in the African setting. But let me move further uh, to the second point. The first growing big economy in, uh, the, the first growing big economy in Sub-Saharan Africa. And we know, that, we know that regulation poses challenges in the absence of formal employment or formal employer-employee relationship. So we, it means that we need government interventions. And of course, the regulatory capabilities or even the strength of institutions in Africa is one thing that we really look into. And the second thing is the mismatch of supply and demand sides of labor market in Sub-Saharan Africa. And we have something that we need to perhaps focus on, policies such as short-term skill development access to credit and tax subsidies that target the supply side. These are structural deficiencies in African labor market, but we can be, they can be resolved. Third, the coexistence of formal and informal sectors. In Africa, markets are segmented. The segmentation actually depends very much on whether they are formal or informal. And it's something, again, that can be resolved by strong institutions. And even strong institutions are very important because they define the rules of the game and they also define their appropriate incentives. A combination of the rules of the game and appropriate incentives will encourage a prudent behavior in the marketplace for us that is very critical. Now, the final point I wanted to make in terms of this intervention is we have seen the growth and even the acceleration of the digital evolution. It is almost a revolution in some areas, in some sectors of the economy. But we need to cross the digital divide in most important process that must be put in place within African uh, workspace. And what we really need is concise, concerted efforts to include an array of solutions, increase digital library, inclusive quality in education and skills acquisition, data and monitoring system. There are so many other things that we can do, but we should avoid disjointed process of single strategy. What I've seen even from my own past, uh, I've seen digital platforms being used for financial transactions and even financial services. They have worked so well. I've read a policy, I've, I've read a policy institution in this. And we have also seen virtual platforms for, for communication. And since the, the, COVID, the, the COVID epidemic struck the African economies, we have seen that actually virtual running platforms have become very important. Even us, we are using virtual running platforms in all our programs, our graduate programs. So it means that we can use it for inclusive training and running platforms. And this is going to benefit all. And more importantly, it will, it will become inclusive. Nobody will be left behind as long as we invest in the appropriate uh, IT infrastructure and budget. And for me, that becomes very, very important. So as, far, as, as part of the closing remark, I just wanted to share those points that I've made, but from the side of uh, East Africa, let me say Asante Sana, or which means, which means uh, thank you. But I'm very happy about the discussions that I've had, and I wanted to share just those three points, that's those few points from ARC, and to know that we are part of the network. We can be reached, we can also provide uh, some areas of uh, our own expertise, and then together we can actually utilize our relative comparative expertise. Thank you very much and good afternoon. Thank you so much, uh, Juguna. And uh, I'm very grateful for these uh, three, three important points, which, uh, which sum up perfectly so many, a, a number of key themes that have really been um, brought up in this, in this conference. You know, just, just to mention the, the last one that you made, um, the, the, the question of, of thinking about the lessons of the pandemic and how actually we, that we can facilitate collaboration in, in very new ways through digital digital platforms. That's an ex, it's been an extremely important running theme of this conference. Uh, but Jean-François, uh, Jean thank you very much. Uh, bienvenue. Um, it, uh, it, we are we are very uh, pleased and honoured that you you can uh, speak at the final um, concluding remarks. It's wonderful to have the uh, IUF present here. And and um, so over to you. Thank you, thank you, Yann. Bonjour, bonjour à tous. Uh, my name is Jean-François Lanceau, Chief Executive Networks uh, at the AUEF. Thank you to welcome me to your conference on behalf of the Director of the AUEF, Slim Calbus, to share with you what is the view of AUEF to strengthen the African Knowledge Society on how the university 
university can play a role in this. But also, how can university be able to be central actors in innovation ecosystem through their research, their students, and their facilities? But let me introduce uh, briefly what the AUF, Agence Universitaire de la Francophonie, has a 1,007 member university, higher education institution, university networks and scientific research centers using partially and fully the French language in 119 countries. Established in 60 years ago, we are the world largest global association in higher education and research institution. Then our mission is to promote scientific promote francophonie area in the world for economic, social and cultural development society by acting in each country on respecting diversity. The six major case of the AUF 2021-2025 strategy to build a scientific francophonie area are the networking by connecting university actors, teachers, researchers, student, economic system, ecosystem, politician, facilitating the sharing of experience or the best practice. The expertise by mobilizing, mobilizing the skill of scientific francophony area on the university for the development and of the society. Build project by setting up international and structuring program with the African Union and European Union or other international or national actors on donors, Canada, France, Belgium, and so on. The internationalization by setting up international partnership, by setting up international program with state and government, with international organization, and finally, by developing international mobility for students, teachers, and researchers. The advocacy, sensitive international development actor of the major role in the scientific francophonie area in addressing societal, uh, societal challenge, SDGs, employability, gender equality, plurilingualism, and so on. The solidarity, mutual help between a university, the most developed university, helping the less advanced university. Finally, our method is to promote solidarity between higher education and research institution with the aim of implementing program that will fundamentally transform the university system. Our method is based on five axes, digital transformation on university governance, employability on entrepreneurships, network on international cooperation, training on trainers on educational innovation, and finally, research on promotion. We operate, we operate in 40 countries and have a network of 59 local branches. In Africa, we have 451 member institutions in 45 countries, 35 local branches coordinated by five sub-regional officials, Dakar for West Africa, Yaoundé for Central and East Africa, Tananarai for Austral African and Indian Ocean, Rabat for North Africa and Beirut for North East Africa. Roughly 50% of our action are for Africa made from Africa. And now let me talk about how the strengthen of the African knowledge society or what we could also call the knowledge economy on how the university contribute to development to the knowledge economy. For the beginning, for the beginning everyone is agreeing to say that the university represents one of the main actors of the intersection of the research, education, and innovation, which places it in the heart of the economy of knowledge. It is actually the main source of the knowledge and the most important player in the transmission of knowledge. However, to stay in this main player of the knowledge economy, it must constantly adapt and innovate to meet the challenge facing them without forgetting their main mission, which is to produce higher level education for people. Firstly, the African university must adapt its training to social, social economic needs to develop the employability and professional integration of students, for example, by create training adapt to the job market, get closer to businesses to discuss their needs, offer work study training in company, train students in entrepreneurship, strengthen student training with soft skills. 
The AUF support African university at all of this level, with, for example, to establishment of student entrepreneur statue in three countries of the North Africa, Project Salem, or development of social entrepreneurship in, in university with the creation of the pre-incubate center, Project Safir, on an ongoing network of 100 employability center in the university. Secondly, African universities must develop mechanisms for varying research on transferring technology to remain competitive and contribute to the economy and development of their country. Then, universities must create quality research structure adapt to the country development needs on mastering the mechanism for protecting and promoting research research. Finally, an action to put in place solution to collaborating this research structure with the socio-economic sector to promote the results of research and transform them into innovation oriented towards the economy, towards production. The AUF is committed is to process to convince the political authorities of this country to set up real and efficient research structure on system up to international standard. It is with the collaboration of international organizations from the countries such as France, Canada, and Belgium that the AUF develops research support program, which consists above of in design research on research tools, which are sometimes non-existent in many countries in the Francophone. Thirdly, African university must internationalize by creating partnership with other universities by developing international mobility projects for students and researchers, organizing scientific conferences, collaborate in major international projects, and finally helping their researchers to publish a major international scientific journal. Then AUF supports its member university in the creation of research mobility programs. For example, one of the last ones, soft, soft grant for organization of scientific conference, or by the way, for rector conferences, or launching calls in its member university collaborate in major international projects global education framework to create program helping researchers on scientific publication and finally create the networks for researchers to their launch in 2021 a network of sustainable urban mobility and another and another in a public health with many african universities finally university must develop digital technology in all its form material publishing digital training digital center website of education resource, digital central case study, set up a reliable information system for better governance and so on. Empowering African students and researchers to master to digital tools essential to innovate. The AUF has been supporting its university in developing their digital capacity for more than 30 years with installation of digital center 60 today and over 100 in 2022. It is a huge effort you are launching because you need are here. In conclusion, the best argument for the African Union and the European Union to invest a long-term societal transformation beyond to the immediate need to, for short-term recovery is to, invest in, is to invest in youth people and students on their major role in the development of their country. For this reason, European Union and African Union could join forces by creating space for innovation in university in close connection with the local ecosystem, creating bridge between social economic sector and civil, civil, civil society. By the way, in Africa, in intra-Africa, on trilateral mobilities for young researchers, face-to-face -face on digital. Finally, European Union on, and, uh, and the African Union could join force by joining the scientific francophonie area. I invite you to go to visit our site, website, www.auf.org, on your regional branch in Dakar, Yaoundé, Antananarivo, Rabat, Beirut, and of course, Brussels. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jean-François, and, and, and you, were, you were very eloquent about um, universities being at the heart of the economy of knowledge, but uh, I, I really want, I, I thought that what you said at the very end 
um, really connects uh, another theme that's been running through the conference wonderfully, which which is the, which is the students that, in a sense, the research in terms of education that we provide ultimately is for the student and it's it's, it's multiplied in its effect through our students, the next generation, um, in you know, whether they become researchers or whether they become uh, you know they they uh, uh, become economic actors in the, in their own right. So so thank you very much for for this. And I just want to um, really close this conference now formally. Also, I think on behalf of uh, Ernest Ariety, um, I don't want to we we've, we've we've run over time, so I don't want to. Um, uh, revisit uh, the key themes of the conference, but I just want to leave maybe with one, one thought, which is that there's been a huge amount of energy um, in, this, um, in this conference and a real determination right from the first contribution from Commissioner Sarah Anyang Agwa um, to really um, invest an urgency, a level of urgency and a level of, of, of transformation in how we think about universities and their role in strengthening the knowledge um, society. And I think that certainly we have, heard a lot of things, um, we've learned a lot of things in this conference. We will now reflect on those, um, both in the Guild and in Arua, I'm sure. Um, and we will certainly uh, want to inform our future actions, depending on what we've heard. But still, clearly, there is a huge amount of investment now in uh, improving um, scientific collaboration between Europe and the uh, Afri and African uh, universities uh, through the through the uh, through Erasmus Plus and Horizon. And we really want to make sure that this is now complemented um, through in investing in new types of partnerships and new types of collaborations, and really in uh, reimagining higher education in Africa, so that in the words of uh, Adam Habib, we really indeed do swim together so that we do not sink. Thank you very much indeed for staying with us and thank you for an incredibly rich uh, conference to all of our participants and to all of uh, our speakers. Thank you. Thank you.